Welcome. Um, this is a tutorial about uh, argumentation theory and uh, how argumentation theory can be used for machine learning or how machine learning can be used for argumentation theory. First of all, yes, I'm recording uh, and eventually in the future this uh, tutorial will also be on YouTube. Um, but uh, uh, questions are more than welcome. I will just cut your voice, so don't worry about uh, that one. And uh, the camera is just taking uh, uh, my face. Acknowledgement, this is um, material that has been developed across several years and uh, in collaboration with several people. So a big thank to uh, all of them. And uh, you will see uh, in the slides that uh, are also available on, on, online um, that uh, uh, there are references to each of those uh, uh, people. So the outline for today is um, we will start with some motivation. Uh, Welcome, Martin. I, know, I don't know if some of you were yesterday at Martin's tutorial, so in the case, apologies, there will be a little of overlap in terms of, of, the, of the motivation. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, take a very narrow view of what argumentation is here. Uh, in particular, I'm going to, to see it as a way for supporting epistemology and scientific inquiry. We are going to talk a little about what is structural argumentation, abstract argumentation, and in particular algorithms and implementations. That is, all of this is necessary for the second part that is about how machine learning can help argumentation and then how argumentation can be supporting uh, machine learning. In the, in the between, at 10.30, uh, in room 24 or five, so down the corridor on the left, uh, Two, two corridors on the left. There will be uh, an award ceremony about the, the international competition of computational models of augmentation. So I will stop the tutorial for 15 minutes to attend the ceremony, and, uh, uh, and then we will just resume uh, the tutorial immediately after. And I will write uh, a, a note on the whiteboard or on the, on the screen uh, for other people. So I would welcome everybody to attend the, the announcement of the competition, also because it's linking very nicely with uh, what we are going to discuss about algorithms and implementations. Now, why argumentation is important, or in particular, what is my personal take about argumentation? Um, as, I as I mentioned before, it's linked to our desire to uh, understand how we know. And um, that is coming back to essentially the beginning of philosophy with uh, the, the notion of the cave where people are just unable to see, they can just see just the shadow of ideas to the idea of anamnesis but then later on to more uh, uh, modern terms of scientific knowledge with empiricism, where if you want to have some, uh, some knowledge about the world, then you are expecting to have some reason to believe that. And I'm very much an empiricist, so that would be my, my take as well. So, to give you an example of what argumentation did for the advancement of uh, scientific knowledge, that it was longer before uh, the creation of formal argumentation. This is the model of the universe for the Greeks and for part of the Middle Ages. So it's the Ptolemaic model. And uh, the Earth is at the center of the universe. And then you have, like, here is the moon, the Mercury, Venus, and they are just orbitating around Earth. So that was the model of astronomy back 2,000 years ago. Everything works. You can actually see the sun moving across the sky. So you can actually have your mathematical model here that describes everything. So the, here is the sun moving around the Earth. Fine, right? Everything is nice. Everything works. Up to this guy, um, 
Galileo Galilei, who invented the telescope, but more important, he pointed the telescope to Jupiter, and he saw this one. This is Jupiter. Those are the satellites of Jupiter. So at this point, he said, well, is, it, it, either the Ptolemaic model is correct, and we have this anomaly in the sky, or we should apply a, a principle of parsimony and say, well, we probably have a different way to assess what is true uh, about the universe. And that is what, in essence, has become a paradigm shift uh, in astronomy. To the point that uh, after Galileo Galilei, then we had Newton with his Principia Mathematica, and uh, we had some axioms, some logical axioms there that is, are, get, are telling us how the universe works. And then it comes another person in our story, Leibniz, who was suggesting, well, if you are giving me a logical representation of the world, and if you are giving me a way to compute new inferences, I can create a machinery, a calculus ratiocination, that can just derive new knowledge. And that is essentially what happened about uh, uh, Uran, so uh, Neptune, sorry, Neptune. So this planet is after Uran, and it has never been seen in, 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 as a telescope, in, a, in a telescope. And uh, in the 1900, uh, this French astronomer, Le Verrier, he started looking not at uh, uh, Neptune, but he was looking at Uranus that we know exist, and he starts saying, well, the movement of Uranus um, uh, does not confirm uh, Newton's theory of gravitation. So either the axioms that uh, Newton created were false, which is a possibility, or maybe it was an uh, instrument measure error, or perhaps was an invisible magic teapot that caused, caused the perturbation to, for whatever reason, or perhaps the Newton's law were correct and also confirmed by empirical evidence, and this means that there was another planet behind that was changing the, the orbit uh, of, of, um, of Uranus. He calculated where this planet would have been, he sent the coordinates to uh, colleagues, astronomers in Berlin, who pointed out a telescope in that position, and they found a planet. So, this is an example of how scientific theories are created. Um, but uh, the nice thing of scientific theories are, is that uh, the, 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 the characteristics that they are falsifiable. So this is Karl Popper with this uh, theory uh, uh, of knowledge, and which means that if, if you pointed out the telescope in that position and there were no planets, then it was a strong evidence against Newton's law. So the idea here is that, uh, as Popper put it in 1989, you want to, you, your theory of knowledge co follows a continuous process of, um, of formulation and tentative to, uh, to falsify them. And this process is at the basis of formal argumentation as well. So let me start, first of all, uh, highlight that uh, this, uh, what I'm going to present is very much based on prior work done with also colleagues in Aberdeen and uh, as well as part of a project, uh, a 10 years project funded by the uh, Army Research Lab in the US and the Ministry of Defense in the UK. And uh, there are a lot of caveats in what I'm going to say, in particular, um, what is an adequate formalization uh, 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 of, the, uh, of something that is true into logic is um, a, an open question in uh, the theory of, of knowledge and the theory of artificial intelligence. And I will welcome very much discussion on this topic, but that is not the main topic of the tutorial. So I will ask you for a little of uh, 
forgiveness in some of the way I formalize some of the elements in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in this presentation. And so let's start with uh, the question, does MMR vaccination cause autism? Um, that is a question that is particularly um, vivid in, the, uh, in several countries, uh, definitely in Europe and the United States. And uh, if you are a scientist, you start with this is a reasonable uh, research hypothesis. And uh, you start saying, well, okay, how can I start formalizing arguments in favor or against this possible hypothesis? And uh, the way in formal argumentation we would do it, most likely, uh, especially in informal uh, argumentation, is to use what they are called argumentation schemes. They are informal pattern of reasoning that can be then formalized in logic just after. So we are going to go through this process of informal formalization first and then formal logic just after. So an argumentation scheme is a structure like this one. It has one or more premises, at least one conclusion, generally one conclusion. And uh, in this case, I'm just uh, reporting the argumentation scheme from, uh, for argument from correlation to cause, which means that uh, if you have a positive correlation between A and B, then this is a prima facie argument in favor of A causes B. Please note that this is not deductive. Uh, this is not always true. This is a tentative conclusion. Indeed, we know that correlation does, is not proof of causation, but it might help you to move in this direction. Then you have to do a lot of more to prove uh, this causation. But this is a first check you would do it. And then you have that uh, um, associated with this argumentation scheme, there are critical questions. <clears throat> and those critical questions are questions that uh, any reasonable person should ask themselves to strengthen the argument. So you should ask yourself, is there really correlation between A and B? Or is there reason to think that perhaps this is just a matter of a coincidence? Or even more, could there be a, a confounding uh, factor here that is causing both A and B? So they are not actually a causation between the two of them, but there is a latent variable behind them. So, those are critical questions that you can just write down and you can ask yourself in order to strengthen or weaken your argument. Now, although this is in informal term, then we already created an ontology for representing whatever argument as an instance of an argumentation scheme. And this is done from the, nine, from the 2011 and uh, uh, is relatively simple. Um, you have essentially is, is a, represented as a graph where each node can be either a scheme node uh, or an information node. And if it is an information node, in, sense, in essence, is just some piece of information, some piece of text or some piece of logic. And then you have um, a scheme of node, a scheme node that can be either a rule of inference uh, or a conflict, so if you want to say that two pieces of information are conflicting, uh, or a preference, or others. There are even more now. So let's start thinking how we would uh, think about our question, does MMR vaccination cause autism? So we would have two pieces of information here. This is our main hypothesis, MMR vaccination causes autism. And if you want to use uh, an instance of the argumentation scheme from cause, correlation to cause, then we, would have, we should have a premise here that is, it is possible that MMR vaccination is associated to autism. It's a sort of, there is correlation between MMR vaccination and autism. This would be uh, the premise for an argument that is an instance of argumentation scheme from, cause, uh, from correlation to cause. And this is a, a representation using this graph uh, nodes that I mentioned before. This in this square, square node is an information node. 
And in this round node is a scheme node, it's an inference node. This is the premise, this is the conclusion. So what you could do then is, okay, uh, I'm here, I have this hypothesis. Now, to prove this hypothesis, I need to prove at least this one first. What you would do, you would do probably you go to Google and search for something that is giving you some piece of evidence in favor of a, a possible correlation between MMR vaccination and autism. And you will find this in famous uh, paper from Wakefield and others. By the way, it has been re uh, retracted since then that uh, inside I uh, was having this nice table of 12 uh, children uh, for which the parents reported that uh, they start um, manifesting autistic type of disease after, immediately after receiving, uh, immediately is a vague terms, but after receiving the MMR vaccination. So in the paper you read that uh, uh, one set of behavioral symptoms was associated by the parents with measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination in eight of the 12 children with measles infection in one child and autism media in another. Um, so this is essentially an argument in favor of there is correlation between MMR vaccination and autism. To be entirely honest with the authors, in their uh, conclusion, they actually say that we did not prove an association between MMR and the syndrome, and you should do more stuff. So this is just a very weak amount of evidence there. And they were actually saying that, uh, well, if, if, um, uh, if that is going to be the case, then there should be a, a, a rising incident uh, since the introduction in the UK of this MMR vaccination in 1988, and they did not observe it yet. But so this so far is, some, a weak type of argument in favor of this uh, correlation between um, MMR vaccination and notice. So we can put it down here in our graph. We can start having another piece of argument here that says, well, we have some evidence that uh, behavioral symptoms were associated by parents of 12 children. And this is a sort of witness testimony about the conclusion it is possible that MMR vaccination is associated to autism. Then you continue uh, your, your, your analysis and you say, okay, at least this, there is some weak type of uh, way to support uh, uh, this premise here. But then I mentioned before that there were critical questions that you were supposed to ask yourself, like uh, is, is actually a correlation this one? Is, is there enough evidence? So you can start searching for counter examples. You go on the internet and you find this paper. This paper is from 2002 and uh, it has a, a population-based study on Mizir, Mums and Robella. And uh, inside you will read that uh, um, they started 537,303 children and they found no association between the age at the time of vaccination or the time since vaccination or the date of vaccination and the development of autistic disorder. So in on one case, you have 12 children. In this case, you have 537,000 children analysis, okay? So this one seems to suggest that uh, if, you merge this, if you could merge these two papers together, then in the previous paper, we had this support for uh, there is some correlation between um, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination and, uh, and, um, and autism. They admitted that uh, they would expect something happen in the large population and they could not find it. So this is actually supporting the fact that uh, this critique is in actually true. So the critical question would be the answer positively which means that uh, there is actually no correlation between MMR vaccination and autism. This is supported by quite a substantial uh, amount of evidence. That's why instead of being a witness testimony, I would represent this one as an evidence to hypothesis type of argumentation. So that's in a, another argumentation scheme that you can find in the book I mentioned before. 
And uh, now we have a new type of link here. This link here is another, sorry, this scheme, this node here round is round, which means it's a scheme uh, uh, node. Uh, is in black just because it's easy to, to see it, uh, the difference between this one, because this is a conflict uh, type of, uh, of scheme. Let's say that uh, you cannot have this conclusion and this conclusion or premise, depending on how you see it, together. One is conflicting with the other. Now you can represent that one as a single directed from one to the other or as a bidirectional one that is com 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 coming to the point of uh, uh, how, what is the correct formalization of a lot of things. So um, we can discuss it, but that is slightly outside the topic of this tutorial. Okay, we have this formalization. Let's assume that this is a decent one or a uh, or even more than decent formalization of this situation of coming from these two papers. The question is now, what can we do? We are computer scientists, so the question is, can we create a machinery? Can we create what uh, Leibniz asked us to create as a calculus ratiocinator? Yes, we can. And uh, 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 there are several approaches in literature for transforming whatever you see here in this graph into a set of logical rules uh, that can be used for building together arguments. And um, I'm just using one of them, um, is um, uh, one of the most uh, used nowadays, that is uh, the ASPIC Plus framework that has been introduced the ASPIC Plus has been introduced in, in 2010 and then uh, revamped in 2013 and in 2014, uh, you can actually have a very nice tutorial. Um, and uh, the idea is, okay, an argumentation system can be seen as a, um, as a set of rules over a logical language. So we start from a logical language here. Uh, the most important thing is that uh, this logical language must have a contrariness function. So you can say when one proposition or one element of this, uh, of this language is the contrary of, the, uh, of another uh, element of this, of this language. And if this is um, um, mutual, then so if phi and, and psi are both contrary of each other, then they call themselves as contradictory. So that is when you have one attacking the other, and vice versa. And then over this logical language, we create a set of strict rules and a set of defeasible rules. Those rules are, uh, think about uh, just classical uh, um, uh, logic programming type of rules, Those, that, that is the flavor. But there is a substantial uh, difference between here, that is, um, Strict rules, in essence, are always true. You can never make them false. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. The feasible rules instead are uh, tentative conclusions. So if the premises of a defeasible rule are true, the conclusion is not necessary hold. So remember the example before, the argumentations came from correlation to cause, the fact that A correlates with B can su suggest that there is a causing relation between A and B, but is not always true. So that is, by definition, a defeasible rule. <clears throat> and then we just <clears throat> bring all together uh, all of these, and that is becoming your argumentation system. Now we have this, this set of notions what we, how we can create what is an argument now. So an argument is defined recursively, but start saying, okay, uh, let's start with uh, each element in our knowledge base is an argument. <clears throat> um, and then after that one, for each argument, we can create new arguments um, using the strict and defeasible rules. So if this one, A1 to AN, 
strictly implies phi or defeasibly imply phi, then we can create a new argument such that this phi becomes the conclusion. Sorry. Um, and this means that uh, you are taking all the conclusions of the argument A1 to AN, and that is the rule that you are actually considering. So conclusion A1, conclusion AN strictly implies phi must be in uh, the set of strict rules. If defeasibly imply phi must be in the set of defeasible rules. And then you can just uh, add it, notions like uh, what are the sub argument so all the uh, arguments that have creating this new argument here become sub argument of this argument uh, you add you can also keep track of all the rules uh, what are the defeasible rules what are the top rules all of these are um, um, extremely useful for very sophisticated very sophisticated type of reasoning on top of uh, aspect plus that we are not going to do in, in this tutorial. Happy to talk about that if you wish. So, a nice, uh, one last nice def def An argument is strict if it has no defeasible rules, otherwise is defined as defeasible, okay? Now, we are back to our graph. The question is how we move from the graph to uh, an aspect plus uh, type of, of, of framework. There are various ways you could do it. Uh, you can do natural language processing, look inside in each of the information boxes, and then create much more sophisticated, sophisticated type of, of structure. The way I'm going to show you is what we implemented in the CI Spaces uh, framework I mentioned before at the beginning of this, of this uh, presentation. And uh, in essence, we transform each information node into a proposition, a propositional language. So we just do no longer look what is inside here. This is just alpha. This is becoming beta. This becomes gamma, delta, and epsilon. And we forget about what is written inside. Okay? Because at this point, we can just create rules for aspect plus. So here we have beta defeasibly implies alpha. Gamma defeasibly implies beta. Uh, epsilon defeasibly implies uh, delta, and then delta is contradictory, uh, is part of the contrariness for beta. So delta contradicts beta, but beta does not contradict delta. Okay? Okay? Now, what does mean this, uh, this, this notion of uh, contradictory between two propositions. Well, we can express a notion of conflict uh, between arguments, and this notion of conflict can be of various types. We can have an undercut um, if we are attacking the application of the rule. Um, we can have the rebut when we have a conflict between the conclusions of two arguments. Or we can have an undermines if we are attacking one of the premise of an argument. Note that typically rebut is bidirectional, uh, but uh, the others are generally one, uh, one directional only. And uh, um, once we have this set of arguments and the set of conflict, whether they are um, uh, undercuts, rebuts, undermines, then what we can create is what is called the abstract argumentation framework by taking all the set of arguments and all the set of attacks together. So if you remember the example before, we have these uh, three rules and this conflict here. What we can do is to create an argument for epsilon, an argument for gamma, then we can also create an argument for epsilon, and epsilon implies delta, therefore delta. Gamma, gamma implies beta, therefore beta. And then gamma, gamma implies beta, beta implies alpha, therefore alpha. 
And uh, here we have this conflict, directional conflict here, that I just just represent by an attack from this epsilon implies delta against this gamma here, um, gamma implies beta. And uh, this is also replicated here because beta implies alpha and beta is attacked by this delta. So this is a new graph, no, no connection whatsoever with uh, what we saw before. Uh, but this is whenever you have nodes and uh, uh, a, a single uh, arrow like this one between them is a representation, at least in this, in this tutorial, is going to be a representation of a Dung's argumentation framework. Each node is an argument and each link is an attack. And once again, we are going to forget everything about what is inside here or which type of attack was this one, whether a rebut, undercut, uh, or undermine. Once again, we are continuing abstracting from the details, and that is the highest level of abstraction uh, we have in the formal argumentation, because ultimately, all we care is uh, which type of arguments we can accept, which arguments are reasonable to be accepted, and all of these in the Dung's theory becomes relevant only on the basis of the type of, on, on, on the attacks. So this is the seminal paper from Dung in 1995. And uh, the, the, the very first uh, definition there is a Dung's argumentation framework is just a pair of arguments and a binary relation on that. So as you can see, there is no notion of what is the structure of the argument inside, no notion of which type of defeat uh, or attack there is inside uh, this, this arrow. It's just essentially a graph uh, between nodes and um, uh, that are arguments. But once you have this one, the question you're asking yourself is <clears throat> how you can find um, arguments that can survive conflict together. So arguments that are, are representing um, a position that is sustainable, meaningful, reasonable, uh, something you can actually uh, accept as a tentative truth. And uh, there are um, several criteria that uh, in Dung's terminology have been defined as um, semantics, and uh, each semantic is providing you with a, uh, uh, um, a set of extension where each extension is a set of argument that is acceptable according to this criterion, uh, according to this uh, semantic. So extension is a set of argument that are collectively acceptable according to a semantic. Dung introduced several semantics in 1995, and uh, their definition is very elegant. Uh, I'm going to choose a slightly different formalization that has been introduced in 2007, uh, just because he's making clearer what are the principles behind some of those uh, semantics and some of those criteria. Um, so in 2007, Pietro and Massimiliano introduced this paper on principle-based evaluation of extension-based argumentation semantics, and uh, that has been also refined with uh, Martin sitting here in, in, in the audience in 2011 on a, a knowledge engineer review paper. And uh, there are several properties that uh, Pietro and Massimiliano introduced. Um, I'm going to just revise some of them and just um, for the for the sake of this presentation. So one of them is conflict freeness. You would expect that uh, uh, um, two arguments that are conflicting each other, they should not be together acceptable. So that is uh, 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 the principle of, indeed of conflict freeness. Admissibility, the principle is that uh, an extension should be able to defend itself. So in the sense that uh, if they are receiving a type of attack, if some of the argument in the extension is, is attacked, then there should be somebody else, is even the argument itself, attacking back. 
I think that uh, Martin is referring this one to the uh, gun, the gunfire principle. Thank you. Um, reinstatement says that uh, if you are defending an argument, then you should bring this argument together with you in your extension. And then maximality is that it's a, no extension should be a proper subset of another one. So essentially you want to have a, maximal, a maximality type of principle here. So a, a little example here, um, this in here is an argumentation framework. We have A uh, and that is an argument that receives no attacks and attacks nothing. Uh, then we have C, E, and G that are arguments that are receiving no attacks, but they are attacking somebody else. And then we have G attacking H, H attacking D and B. And then here we have a strange configuration where B and D are mutually conflicting, D and F are mutually conflicting, and F and B are mutually conflicting. And now we want to combine the principle I mentioned before in order to provide uh, semantics that uh, can identify a set of arguments that are collectively acceptable. So um, a possible way for doing that one is to derive what is called a complete extension that satisfy admissibility and reinstatement. So in essence, it's a set of conflict-free arguments such that each defended argument is included, which means that uh, uh, in this case, A, C, E, and G are always be part uh, of, this, uh, of each of the complete extensions here. Um, if we now look at uh, some of the arguments that can be defended, now G attacks H, that is attacking D and B, which means that uh, because G is inside here, then most likely D or B must be there. Uh, unfortunately, D and B are conflicting each other, which means that uh, you can have one extension where D is in and one where B is in. Um, and uh, the last one is when uh, you just get A, C, E, and G. That is the minimum one uh, that, uh, uh, that you can have is a complete extension. There is no requirement for maximality for complete extensions. Indeed, this, this, this requirement for maximality is introduced with the preferred extensions, and at this point, uh, 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 the preferred extensions coming from the complete extensions are complete extensions that are maximal. So that's a uh, respect set inclusion, which means that uh, you cannot have one to be a subset of another. And if you remember before, there was an, uh, one here uh, that has been uh, removed. And um, another ex ex type of semantics that uh, we are going to use later on in the, in the presentation is the stable extension, where it's, it's, it's looking at uh, complete extensions attacking all the arguments that are outside the extension itself. Which means that uh, if you are taking the set that are inside the complete extension, and if you are taking all the, com the complement of this set, so all the other arguments, that are not in this extension, then there should be at least one attack from each of them to, to one of them to each of the argument outside. So here, for instance, we have A, C, D, E, and G. A, C, E, D, and G. H is outside, it's attacked by J. B is outside, it's attacked by D. And F is attacked by E. And another property that uh, uh, is interesting here is if the stable extension exists. Stable extension among the, ex the, the semantics that has been introduced by Dung is the only one that cannot exist potentially. And uh, proving whether it exists or not is NP complete. Um, but if a stable extension exists, then this stable extension is also a preferred extension. And that is a nice property we are going to see later on uh, in this presentation as well. Now, <clears throat> There is an alternative way to see this relationship between uh, uh, semantic uh, 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 extensions uh, introduced, uh, I think, originally by Bart, but then uh, developed substantially by Martin sitting here in the terms of labelings. Where a labeling is a function from 
an a set of arguments to, um, to a label uh, that can be in the traditional format one of these three, in, out, or undecided. And uh, you have now conditions on how to put uh, these labels. So an argument can be labeled in uh, if and only if all its attackers are out. An argument is out if at least one of its attackers is in and otherwise is undecided. So if we are coming back to, uh, by the way, this is also highlighting what is the complete labeling uh, 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 of, uh, of uh, an argumentation framework. But on top of these complete labelings that have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the complete extensions, we can define now a preferred labelling that is takes a, a maximal with respect to set inclusion in argument. So before we had that uh, uh, A, C, E, and G, and D uh, are member of a, of a preferred extension, which means that, okay, this receives no uh, attacks whatsoever, which means that it must be in. The same for C, E, and G. Let's look at this one. This can be labeled in because all its attackers are out, while this is out because all of its attack, at least one of its attackers is in. So this in makes this out. This out allows this one to be in. If this is in, this must be out. And then we have the uh, opposite case where B is in and D is out. Similarly, we can define the notion of stable uh, labeling um, by imposing that uh, no undecided uh, must be uh, part of it. So, sorry, this is a typo. The title should be stable labelings. And um, if you are imposing this, uh, this requirement, it means that uh, you can never have an argument labeled as undecided uh, in this argumentation framework for having a stable, uh, for, for being that one, a stable labeling. And here you can actually see why then uh, the, the, there is a correlation between, uh, uh, correspondence between stable labelings and referral labelings. Clearly, if you cannot have any, uh, anything that is uh, undecided, everything must be either in or out, which means that you are maximizing the set of in arguments there. So this is one of the labelings for stable, and the other one is the opposite, once again, as in the case for the preferred. As I mentioned before, uh, complexity of all these of, of problems associated with semantics have been started um, and solved, at least for the case of, um, of abstract argumentation frameworks, things quite a long time now. And we know that uh, there are uh, one, there are five important decision uh, uh, um, uh, tasks uh, that are linked to, um, um, to uh, absolute argumentation framework, whether a semantics uh, extension exists, whether an argument is credulously accepted, an argument is credulously accepted according to a, a, a semantics if this argument belongs to at least one of the extensions, skeptically accepted of an argument according to a semantics if this argument belongs to all the extensions, um, verifying uh, whether a set of argument is indeed an extension and whether uh, non-emptiness, whether uh, a, a semantics as a, a, for an argumentation framework as a non-empty uh, extension. And uh, in the case of complete, uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, the, the, the hardest bit are credulous, accept, uh, credulous acceptance and, and non emptiness. There is a fourth uh, semantics that are not introduced, but uh, is the dual of preferred, which means that uh, if preferred is maximal complete extension, the grounded is the minimal one. And indeed, if you're looking at the complete extension, there was this bit here that we almost neglected long during the presentation, this indeed is the grounded extension. That is the minimal complete extension. And uh, the grounded extension has a nice property, everything is polynomial. 
and it's also the most skeptical one, among the most skeptical one, in the sense that uh, it allows only one extension. But uh, if you're looking at now preferred extension and stable extensions, then we can see that uh, for the preferred case, uh, we are getting up to the second level of the polynomial complexity, hierarchy, sorry, uh, with the skeptical acceptance of, uh, according to the preferred extension to be P tau P complete. And that brings us to why we care about uh, uh, all of this in terms of algorithms and implementations. So, computational models of argumentation started uh, mostly as a theoretical branch of artificial intelligence, but uh, uh, at least in the last 10 years there has been a substantial development in the direction of having algorithms and implementation working uh, to the point that now is also the third time we are running uh, international competition, computational models of argumentation. And Stefano here is actually one of the organizer of that, uh, of that, uh, um, um, of, of, of this uh, uh, competition. And as I mentioned at the beginning <coughs> of the tutorial, I repeat it now uh, for whom of you uh, uh, arrived uh, in, in the last half an hour or so. At 10.30 there will be the announcement of the winners of the competition in uh, a room down the corridor on the left. Um, I will stop the tutorial for the 15, 20 minutes uh, needed for the announcement because I would like also to know it. Um, and then I will resume the tutorial after. So I would welcome everybody also to attend uh, the, uh, the announcement of the result of the competition at 10.30. Now, 10 years, a lot of things happened, and uh, there has been two main references that I would recommend everybody to look at. One is a paper, uh, a survey paper, um, um, that has been published in 2015. That is very good, but not as good as uh, the, 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 the chapter that we wrote for the uh, first handbook, the first volume of the Handbook of Formal Argumentation uh, that has been published uh, uh, two years, last year, um, and uh, you probably can find it uh, also in a journal version published by College uh, Publication. In essence, algorithms for computing, uh, for reasoning about argumentation frameworks at the abstract level are distinguished in two big families. One of them are non-reduction based uh, uh, procedures, and one will be reduction based procedures. So the non-reduction based procedures are in essence algorithms that are doing a search in the space of possible labelings in essence, uh, straight on, on the argumentation framework with ad hoc procedures. So in this case, I'm just taking uh, as an example, uh, the case of uh, Arc Tool um, that has been pr provide, um, proposed in 2013, 2014. And uh, in essence, uh, they start um, assuming that everything is unknown, blank. Um, and then yeah, they have labelings that can be in, out, blank, must out, or undecided. And they use this type of labelings to go through a deep first type of search into the space of this conflict in order to identify which are uh, possible labelings that uh, are, are, are reasonable, and in the case they find assignment of labels that are conflicting, so at the same time an argument should be both in and out, for instance, then they backtrack to the point of finding uh, another assignment that can be uh, uh, satisfiable here. So there are a few approaches here, uh, working in non-reduction based procedures. Um, uh, we are coming to pro and cons in a, in, in, in a second. Um, and each of them are quite uh, specific to uh, the specific type of argument or, 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 or semantics they are dealing with. And then instead we have also reduction based um, um, approaches. And um, uh, reduction based approaches in essence, they take an argumentation framework, they transform it into another representation that uh, 
uh, we are already pretty used in 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 in, in, in or knowing into in artificial intelligence, and for which we already have a solver, and then we just use the solver behind um, in order to uh, to compute the solution. So, for instance, Stefano and colleagues propose a CSP-based approach uh, that is taking an argumentation framework, creates variables for each of the argument in the argumentation framework. Uh, after that one, they encode the constraints uh, be, regarding the different definition of Dung's argumentation framework uh, into this constraint satisfaction problem. As, I, as you noticed before, in essence, all the labeling or all the complete extension in essence is a constraint problem. Um, so for instance, having that uh, A and B to be conflict free, it, it requires that you cannot accept both arguments at the same time. And uh, once you have your variables, once you have your, uh, your constraints, uh, we have constraint satisfaction solvers since quite some times now. You run it, you get the result, you win. Similarly, for answer set programming, um, so that has been uh, proposed from 2010. That is, was one of the uh, main success stories in, 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 um, um, in, in abstract argumentation. Indeed, in, in some of the uh, last competition, they, they, they won uh, substantially. We don't know what is happening with this competition. <clears throat> but uh, in essence, you have an uh, uh, answer set program for representing uh, the argumentation framework and the semantics. So in this case, for instance, uh, you, you might, you, this is the program for defining um, the stable semantics, and uh, you're looking at the fact that, uh, for instance, this one is uh, an argument can be either in or out. Uh, it, it cannot be both in and out, etc., etc. And you can encode all the requirements that uh, you need for computing the stable extensions in terms of a logic program. You run the answer, an answer set program, you, you run an answer set solver, and you get the results. <clears throat> in the case you need subset maximality, often uh, you can rely to other uh, uh, systems. That's, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the case your answer set does not support it automatically, like the meta ESP uh, optimization front end for Gringo. You can also express um, um, uh, element, uh, sem semantics extensions in, in second order logic, and that has been proposed in KR couple of, uh, 2016. In essence, you just describe all your, your, your requirements directly into the logic. You have a nice uh, solver for this type of, uh, of logic. You just compute it, uh, the results, and that is, uh, that is uh, you, you just have the, the, the result out of it. Now, in honor or truth, I think that uh, uh, the, these, um, these, these uh, authors themselves never participate into the competition. And they also admit that uh, the, this approach is not the fastest one, but it's definitely the most customizable in the sense that uh, they show that uh, this uh, these, um, declarative uh, solver is, can, be, can handle substantial type of problems, not just abstract argumentation, but uh, arbitrary one, as long as they can represent it into uh, at most second order logics. And then, if we talk about CSP, we talk about ASP, we cannot not talk about SAT. <clears throat> and uh, SAT-based approaches for abstract argumentation has been proposed since 2013, 2014, uh, with this uh, paper from uh, colleagues in Vienna. And in essence, uh, what they did, they look in particular at the case of uh, admissible sets and preferred extensions, and uh, they represented uh, given an argument, they represent uh, this argument as a variable, exactly as discussed before for the case of CSP. And uh, then you just encode all your requirements in terms of, um, of, 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 of logical dependencies between them. So for instance, this one is uh, the, the element of um, 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 conflict freeness, and uh, this one is for admissibility. This encoding was Initially, originally uh, proposed in uh, 20, 2001, 
uh, by Bernard and Dutz. Uh, but then the first implementation using uh, transforming this one into CNF and then running a SAT solver was uh, by colleagues in Austria. <clears throat> now, I'm the author of one of the approaches uh, using SAT solver as well, and that's why I'm going to use a, a different variation of, of what I just said to illustrate some interesting uh, uh, elements uh, linked to uh, the, the, the efficiency of SAT-based approaches. And uh, all of this has been published as we speak, in the sense that yesterday I sent the, uh, the proof on our AI paper, AIJ paper, uh, on, 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 the, on, on the, in essence, on the system that uh, won the preferred uh, semantic tracks of the International Competition of Computational Model of Argumentation of 2017. Uh, the name is uh, ArxMSOT. <clears throat> now, the idea is differently from what we saw um, before for the case of, uh, uh, of the approach developed by the colleagues in Vienna. We are not using uh, extension, we are using labelings. And uh, if you remember before, I said labelings are constraints in essence. You are labeling an argument in if and only if all these uh, uh, attackers are out. You are um, um, uh, labeling an argument as out if at least one of these attackers is in, and otherwise is undecided. So it says, in essence, those are constraints over uh, a, a logic, uh, over possible logical language. So for instance, this one is one of the <clears throat> uh, way to represent these constraints. So here we have labeling of A is in, implies that for all the attackers of uh, A, A uh, subscript minus is the set of attackers of A. So for all the attackers of A, the labeling of this B of these attackers must be out. So this is one direction of the implication. Then we have the opposite direction because the original definition is if and only if for having complete uh, labelings. Um, so we can have this uh, 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 labeling A is in only if uh, all the uh, attackers are labeled out. The same you can have it for the labeling A of out exists at least one attacker that is labeled in and the opposite uh, implication. And for the, uh, the undecided, we can expand it, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, conditionals by just saying, okay, an argument A is undecided. If uh, all the attackers of A are not in, and there is at least one attacker that is undecided. So this is one direction of the, of the implication and the opposite direction there. And then we can have, uh, just in terms of notation, uh, whenever you have this uh, uh, subscript, subscript uh, with the double arrow means that uh, there is both direction of the implication. And uh, when you have something like this, it means that uh, we are choosing a specific type of encodings of complete labelings, uh, such that, for instance, in this one, we are using, okay, the C in, uh, right implication, uh, the C out with both uh, direction of the implication, and this tilde means that we are not considering, for instance, in this case, the third element is the undecided. Why this? Because knowing that also the, the, the labeling must be a total function, we, we can have different ways for encoding uh, these labelings. All of them are logically equivalent, because given the fact that we also know that it is a total function, if you are using, for instance, only C in right, C out right, and C undecided right, uh, with the total function, will give us the exact uh, 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 result. And this is what it was something that already Martin uh, analyzed in, 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 in his paper with uh, Dov Gabi, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in this AIJ paper, we look at uh, all the possible combinations, and the reality is that clearly there are 
combination that uh, are not uh, acceptable, that are not correct, that are not giving you the, the right uh, result. But then there are several, so in these pictures, uh, the one above this dotted line are uh, the one that's uh, uh, actually uh, giving you the correct answer, provided he's also adding the fact that this is a total function. And uh, we can actually see that uh, there are correlate uh, relationship between this type of uh, constraints in a sense of that can be expressed in a sort of uh, Hasse diagram. So uh, in this case, for instance, the, 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 the smallest type of uh, constraints you can have is when you're looking just a single direction of the implications. Um, but then you can actually add also the other direction, for instance, in this case for the out, uh, the same here for the undecided, uh, or here for the in, or here for the undecided, etc. So essentially, here you have just uh, three, uh, three implications, and that is giving you uh, the possibility to, co to create a complete labeling. Here you have four, here you have five implications, and here you have six implications. Now, once you have this type of implication, you can transform them into CNF, that is uh, standard and boring. But once you have this, uh, this CNF, in essence, you have everything you need to just run it on a SAT solver. And uh, not yet, or not uh, straightforwardly. So, this one is the algorithm um, for the stable extension, and this is the algorithm for the preferred one. So starting from the uh, stable one, because it's, uh, 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 it's relatively simpler, but also it, has a, it is needed for explaining the preferred as well, we can start saying, OK, uh, the, first, the first one, the first option that we created is uh, given the fact that uh, computing all the um, uh, um, uh, uh, stable ex uh, computing a stable extension in essence is to find a model for uh, this problem and that is can be solved directly by a SAT solver. We know that uh, there are solvers that can enumerate all the stable extensions that are called the all SAT solvers. So the first one is you can choose to, send to, to just use all SAT. And uh, all that is just taking the CNF uh, of your en encoding of your argumentation framework, uh, given the type of encoding you choose. So given the, the, the combination I showed you before uh, among all of, all, all of them. Um, and uh, you take the CNF and you add the constraints that for all arguments, all, uh, you cannot have an undecided. So in essence, in here, Differently from what uh, colleagues in Austria did, we do not have one argument, one variable. We have one argument, three variables. For, for each argument, this argument uh, as a variable representing whether this argument is labeled in, out, or undecided. So in this case, conjunction over arguments in the argumentation framework, not UA, and that is, uh, uh, um, uh, implies that uh, uh, no argument can be labeled as undecided. So, okay, if you can use an OSAT that is, uh, is giving you all the results in a single go, otherwise you need to start saying, okay, uh, let's start getting one, um, one model, and then we also need to have a blocking clause. So a representation of this model such that if we are adding this uh, close to the same uh, CNF before, and we run it again, the SAT solver, then the previous model will not be one of the possible solutions. Okay? So in this way, we can just continue eliciting new, uh, new models uh, out of this uh, SAT problem. And uh, there are, if we are computing these blocking close ourselves, there are two different ways. Given a stable extension, if you are imposing that at least uh, some, some arguments must be out of this, uh, of this table, 
uh, otherwise, let's say some of the other uh, arguments must be uh, outside, it must be in. So if, if you, have this, uh, uh, you have a stable extension represented as your argument, uh, uh, represented in your proposition or variable, then either you are forcing the SAT solver to look outside for other in argument, or you are saying that at least one of these arguments that were inside this argumentation in this stable extension must be out in the new iteration. And then you repeat. Okay, so this is in essence is uh, from line five to line 16 is in essence the way a, a, a naive all SAT uh, so solver would work. If you look now at uh, uh, the case of the preferred extension, the first one is, if you remember what I mentioned before, each stable uh, extension is also a preferred extension if it exists. So this, alg this algorithm <coughs> allows you to call first the SAT solvers to or the old SAT solver to compute all the stable extensions first, and then search for the other extensions that are preferred but not stable. And uh, how you do the, the other uh, uh, extensions that are preferred but not stable? Well, once again, you start from, you put all your uh, block link clause for all the stable if they existed. And then you start saying, okay, give me a solution. This must be a complete labeling. Uh, that is by definition because of the conflict, you, you, you constraint you put down there. Um, and uh, uh, once you have this complete, you want to maximize the, the set of arguments in inside this complete which means that uh, in a second loop inside, you are doing a sort of hill climbing where you are forcing that uh, among the, 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 the set of arguments that uh, there are in your complete, you might want to have other arguments outside this complete to be in. So you are forcing uh, some of the arguments out outside this complete to be in. Um, and you repeat until you can no longer satisfy uh, these constraints, which means that you reach the maximal one. And once again, you need to keep track of these blocking clauses in order to repeat calling the SAT solver for another preferred extensions after that you did not find it before. And once again, there are different ways for identifying those, uh, those blocking clauses, both within the hill climbing and outside in terms of uh, searching for in the space of complete extensions. Why all of this matters? It matters for performance substantially. So if you are considering uh, uh, um, uh, the, the IPC score for computing the, the, the performance of different options among those that I mentioned, the IPC score was developed uh, originally for the planning competition, and that is indeed the International Planning Competition score, IPC score. And uh, uh, given um, <clears throat> a problem P and a solver S, you are giving zero uh, if uh, the problem is unsolved. Uh, otherwise, you are giving one over one plus logarithm base 10 of TPS over T star P, where TPS is the time that this solver needed to solve this problem, this instance. And T star P is the minimum amount of time required by any solver for solving this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this instance. So you have an instance, which can be an argumentation framework uh, with uh, specific semantics, and you want to compute all the semantics extensions, for instance. And then you have several uh, solvers for this one. And you run all of them. You take the minimum time, that is your T star P, and then for each of the other, you are combining, you are considering the score with this formula. So in essence, this is not an absolute uh, um, 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 measurement. This is a relative one because it depends on the, on the solvers you are considering in your experimentation. So in this case, we have solvers that are the different configurations for the different type of, uh, for the different way to com create uh, complete labeling. So here are all the possible combination I mentioned before. This is, for instance, is the C where we are using the free implication, the right implication. Uh, this one is when we are using 
um, the C, uh, the, the, the complete labelings with uh, all the six implications. And uh, in these graphs, higher the higher the better. So we can start seeing that uh, this one is it seems to be higher, and that is in the case of uh, enumerating the stable extensions over the set of benchmarks that have, were used in the uh, international competition, computational models of argumentation in 2015. Uh, and the same pattern applies also for 2017. So the same ones that are higher here are higher here as well. Interestingly enough, that applies not just for stable, but uh, for preferred as well. So in the preferred ICCMA 2015, ICCMA 2017, the higher one are still the same. And the highest looks to be consistently this uh, right, right, right implication. So the explanation uh, we found uh, that is at least was reasonable enough for the AIJ reviewers was that, uh, first of all, these five one have one characteristics in common. None of them has this C and the side with left implication, which is written down in CNF as this one. Uh, because you need to check that uh, no attacker is in and at least one of the attacker is undecided. And if you have the implication from right to left, this is the way you would write it down in CNF. And uh, this is the longest type of clauses you can have among all of them in, 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 in uh, among all that we created for these complete labelings. Because you have here a long chain, a possible long chain of um, uh, of logical O in the same clause, uh, searching for uh, uh, searching that no arguments, no attacker to be in uh, to uh, avoid uh, uh, to to ensure that uh, that is uh, um, uh, that your argument is undecided. So, for having an argument to be undecided, no attackers must be in, and that checking for this one. Uh, is transform it means that uh, you're transforming this one in a long chain of O. And uh, we already know that such solvers, at least uh, using uh, DPLLL type of uh, algorithm, perform better when you, have clo well, when you have short closes in O. So that is reasonable why these five one are among the most performant. The closes are shorter. And the other one is that uh, 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 among uh, all of these, there are only two non-redundant encodings so that you are not uh, repeating the same type of, uh, of, of implications, uh, which is uh, this, this one here and this one that has the, um, uh, the, 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 the double implication. But uh, this double implication, because, uh, uh, because of the additional requirement for the stable semantics, becomes redundant at that point, because you will not longer need the third labeling of undecided here. So, which means that uh, suggests that this one, uh, both in the case of the stable and of the preferred, seems to be the, the, the most uh, uh, performant one, because it's the shortest, and is also the one that has less redundant information inside uh, the encodings. Um, in the paper, there is much more. So if you are interested in the domain of, uh, uh, of uh, SAT base uh, solver for uh, abstract argumentation, um, there are much more information there, uh, including um, the fact that uh, using an old SAT solver leads to significant improvement for enumerating stable labelings. And uh, enumerating stable labelings first can lead to a significant improvement of enumerating preferred labelings. And uh, the, we also had specific algorithm for credulous. Well, credulous is relatively easy, but skeptically acceptance of argument. Remember, skept, an argument is skeptically accepted according to a semantic if this argument belongs to all the extension of this semantics. And uh, this improved algorithm for skeptical acceptance with respect to preferred semantics um, was uh, key for winning uh, ICCMA 2017. 
So, it has been a long journey, deep diving into um, uh, semi, uh, how to compute extensions, but we started from this example about autism and, uh, and uh, MMR vaccination, and I did not yet tell you what is the end of the story. So, we have our graph here that is uh, about the possibility that MMR vaccination causes autism. We found some possible um, um, way to tentatively prove that uh, there might be some correlation based on 12 children. This is the infamous uh, uh, Wakefield paper. But then we have a much stronger analysis that says that there is no correlation whatsoever uh, between MMR vaccination and autism. We take this one, we transform into logical rules. Uh, these logical rules can be used into an aspect plus type of system. We created a Dung's argumentation framework. Now we can compute the semantics extensions. We have all the machinery and we have all the implementation behind for doing it. And because there is no cycles, in essence, all the semantics collapse to the grounded extension. So it's the minimum complete extension you can have, which is going to be also the, uh, uh, the only one. So in this case, the arguments that can be accepted are this one that I have no attackers and are attacking nothing, and this one that has no attackers, which means it is in, and these two arguments, because they receive an attack, then they are out. So they are cannot be inside this extension. If we map back into the propositions we have before, then it means that these two conclusions are unsupported uh, by this, uh, because of this type of attack. So essentially, you are stopping this, this chain of inferencing at this level. You are not attacking the fact that uh, uh, there is evidence that for 12 children, there was a correlation between, a possible association between MMR vaccination and notice, that there is nothing attacking this one. Uh, this one is a defeasible inference. So you cannot do modus tollens by saying, well, if this is false, therefore this one is also false. So you cannot say much about this one, but you can definitely say that this one is not warranted and this conclusion is not warranted either. Now, all of this has been implemented on a system uh, through uh, different fundings from the Army Research Lab and uh, the Ministry of Defense in the UK, and uh, it has been um, uh, tested with professional intelligence analysts. Um, these analysts highlighted how the system that is implementing the, this, this process that I just mentioned you uh, is uh, very useful for training and is uh, allowing them to audit what is the reasoning process behind an analyst. So you can actually track back all the hypotheses and checking whether or, uh, uh, they do the due diligence in asking all the necessary critical questions. Uh, it is actually deployed on a dedicated machine at the Army Research Lab at the Fire Laboratory Center. And uh, we now have an online version that is MIT licensed. Everybody can use it. There is a, a implementation available for everybody. Um, but if you want, you can just download the code and install it on your machine. And uh, this version has been actually used for an uh, in-depth analysis of uh, the case of Prosecutor versus Karadzic, uh, that, is, uh, that was in front of the International Criminal Court of Justice, and for which uh, myself and a colleague uh, from uh, the law department at Swansea University, we wrote uh, uh, um, uh, Amicus Curia. So we submitted our opinion to the International, International Criminal Court of Justice. And funny enough, in the, after the appeal procedure, most of the things that we wrote in our conclusions, you can actually echo, they actually echoed in the judgment uh, of the appeal as well. So, <clears throat> In the case you want to play with the implementation, there is a freely available uh, installation for everybody. Uh, the details are also on the web page of this tutorial, so you, uh, that's fine. Uh, we choose not to have a, a DNS just to not publicize too much. Yes. So this, just to give a, a, a flavor, this is, uh, for instance, the, one of the maps that uh, we created for the case of Karadzic. I'm not expecting you to, to see it, but uh, 
uh, the, the slides are online, uh, and you can download it if you want, and there is a link also to the original document. But we are actually using the same type of argumentation schemes I mentioned before, like a evidence to hypothesis, witness testimony, exactly the same type of approach I, I mentioned today for the case of MMR, vaccination, and, uh, and autism. Now, this is also informed uh, research on supporting scientific inquiry with uncertain sources. That goes more in the direction of having a, a probabilistic flavor. Uh, and uh, I, I welcome everybody to download it and read it. It's beautifully written, of course. Um, and uh, uh, this cspaces.org has been published in uh, Comma uh, last, uh, last year. And uh, we also uh, presented uh, the case, uh, uh, the, the same system at uh, the Legal Knowledge and Information Systems Conference, uh, using uh, examples coming from uh, uh, not necessarily Corazic because we are, we are still writing up about that one. Um, but uh, what I wanted to highlight here is just that uh, one of the characteristics of CA spaces is in addition to allow you to draw this type of inferences and compute the extensions, and it uses behind Arx and SAT, the same system I, I mentioned before. It allows you also to, uh, so this is uh, uh, the, the, the online uh, uh, implementation. It allows you to also produce a report automatically uh, that is highlighting what are the main reasons for believing certain type of, uh, of, of, of elements. So, you have here the conclusions of uh, acceptable arguments, and you also have the reason to believe that, and whether that one is linked to something else down, or whether it comes to some piece of information that uh, is beyond question. So to summarize this first part, uh, I think this is coffee break, right? It's time coffee break, right? Ten. Uh, just to summarize this first part, and then I'm going to give you a little of a teaser uh, of what is going to happen in the second part. Um, yes, we can help humans in structuring their reasoning. Um, we can also reduce the effect of some biases, in particular confirmation bias, because if you are using argumentation schemes and if you are asking all the relevant critical questions, you are uh, avoiding some uh, easy trap in which you can fall uh, if, if you're not doing your due diligence. We have machineries to derive arguments and attacks as long as you are gentle enough to accept that the formalization, the logical formalization is correct. And after that one, we have machineries to derive acceptable arguments on the basis of different criteria, different semantics extensions. And uh, this perform the performance of such mach machineries uh, varies dramatically on the basis of a variety of uh, parameters. And uh, I give you an in-depth uh, analysis on, on the solver, uh, one of the most configurable solver that uh, we have nowadays in uh, abstract argumentation. Nowadays, until alpha an hour, I remember that uh, there is the announcement of the uh, 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 award ceremony of the competition on computation models of argumentation in room 24. Or five, I will be uh, there, so uh, I will start uh, the, the tutorial at probably uh, 10.45 again. And uh, what we are going to talk now uh, in, in, in the second part will be machine learning for argumentation. And in particular, as you could see before, we essentially have two magic boxes. Uh, I hand wave a lot of things in particular for the creation of arguments. But the question is, the arguments should come from somewhere, and sometimes arguments are from text. So the question is, how machine learning can help us in creating argument? And then, uh, uh, um, on the other side, we are evaluating arguments, but uh, there are a lot of ways you can do it, and there are a lot of um, problems there, in particular on the complexity. If you remember, skeptical acceptance of preferred argumentation of preferred semantics is uh, at the second level of polynomial uh, hierarchy, which means you might want to have some quick and dirty type of analysis first using some machine learning. And uh, uh, 
after all of these, uh, we are going to go to the um, uh, what uh, argumentation can do for um, machine learning, which is um, if we have a very high level of what is a machine learning algorithm, we, we start from some data, we create a model, and given this model, we do some inferencing. Now the question is where argumentation can play a role here. Well, we will see that uh, in the case of data, what we discussed before becomes very much relevant because testing that uh, your data is the right data is in essence what we did before. The model, the question is how you create a dialogue between you as a human and a machine learning system in order to exchange information between them. It can be in forms of explanation from the uh, machine learning or it can be you as a human telling something to the machine learner. And finally, something about inferencing uh, in particular based on uh, some of the uh, studies on how, how um, um, uh, machine learning can be used in real world and in particular in, in, in legal domains, for instance. So thank you very much for your attention so far. Um, as I said, uh, I will start again at 10.45. Um, I will welcome everybody to join uh, our colleague for the announcement of the International Competition Computational Models of Argumentation results for the 2019. Um, and I will see you back here in 45 minutes. If there is any question, I'm more than happy to take it uh, offline. Thank you very much. So this morning, we started discussing um, what is uh, formal argumentation and uh, in the first part of the tutorial we talked about in particular um, an example, a case-based study on what is um, argumentation, formal argumentation and um, um, I'm recording this uh, tutorial, hopefully at some point it will be available on YouTube unless I made something horribly wrong with my configuration. But uh, I will cut any question, so don't, uh, no, your voice will not be on YouTube unless you wish so. So <clears throat> the second part of this tutorial is about uh, um, the correlation or the use of argumentation for machine learning or the use of machine learning for argumentation. And we are going to start uh, from machine learning for argumentation. Um, and uh, earlier in the tutorial, we essentially talk about two magic boxes. One magic box is helping us creating arguments. I show you in, in, the, in the first part of this tutorial how this can be done uh, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in a case study. And then there is a second one that is on about the evaluation of, uh, of arguments. So how we can compute uh, arguments that uh, are collectively acceptable um, um, for, uh, uh, according to some semantics, some criteria uh, behind. So let's start from the first magic box, uh, the creation of arguments. In the first part of the tutorial, we went through a very laborious, long process ma of manual creation of, uh, of arguments. But in reality, arguments exist in natural language format, mostly. Uh, there are arguments that can be more visual as well. Um, for the sake of this tutorial, we just briefly consider uh, arguments in natural language format. And uh, um, I would recommend everybody to read the chapter on the Handbook of Formal Argumentation published in 2018 uh, from Kasia Budzinska and Serena Villata uh, on processing natural language argumentation. That is, uh, informing large part of, uh, of this presentation for this part in this tutorial. And uh, in that paper, you will see that there is a, um, a description of a pipeline for uh, creating arguments from large resource of natural language text. And uh, the first step is to 
have an, a scheme, an annotation theory um, for, for representing what uh, you wish to extract from text. Now, we already looked at uh, some of these annotations in some form earlier today, like when we were talking about uh, uh, this ontology for representing uh, argumentation uh, schemes. So when we want to represent informations or schemes node. Um, but then there are other type of annotations uh, you might want to consider for the sake of um, argumentation mining. Um, some of them might be linked to the inference anchoring theory from Kasia, Budzinska, and Chris Fried. Um, so if, if here you have on the right side some piece of natural language text, like Bob says the government will inevitably lower the tax rate, then Wilma say why? And Bob says lower taxes stimulates the economy. What you actually can see here is that each of them are sort of information boxes uh, in the terminology, information nodes in the terminology we were seeing from this morning. But then these relationships are not uh, of argumentation schemes, but they can be part of this inference anchoring theory uh, that are referring to whether a piece of uh, information is challenging something. So this Y is challenging this statement. Uh, this uh, bit here is substantiating this bit at the, at the beginning. And uh, there is also the connection between who is saying what and what is said. So Bob says the government will inevitably lower the tax rate. This means that uh, there is an agent, Bob, asserting a specific uh, statement, the government will never really lower the tax rate. And the fact that there is the substantiating uh, act, this can be transformed into uh, application of argumentation scheme for positive consequences, for instance, uh, that has as a premise this assertion coming from the substantiating uh, element uh, here. Why this why here? is challenging this conclusion here. So in essence, on the left side here, you have very much what we were discussing this morning in terms of argumentation schemes, where in essence, this is a premise, uh, a scheme uh, with an application of argumentation scheme, and this would be the conclusion. <clears throat> so in essence, you want to describe what you want to tag in the text and for doing what. There are various argumentation structures, and in the paper, in the chapter, you can see uh, several of them described there. But at the same time, uh, there is a substantial risk of over-engineering. So to give evidence for this one, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, with colleagues, we were locked in into a dark stool uh, event. And uh, here is the, is the uh, uh, five of us. And uh, we were given uh, a, a task uh, to um, given a question, should contraception be covered by earth insurance? And given an extract uh, from debate.org, if I remember correctly, uh, they, the organizer of the Dark Stool uh, event just told us, forget about whatever you know about uh, uh, annotation schemes, just invent whatever you want. Uh, and we want to explore what is possible more than uh, how to do something that uh, we already know how to do it. And uh, the text was uh, a sequence of statements like this one um, on, on, that you can see on the right. Um, that uh, they were coming indeed from this uh, forum type uh, of uh, online resource. So um, somebody was posting the question that uh, we saw before, should contraception be covered by earth insurance? And then somebody was replying after, for instance, no, because that's not something you need. So we start saying, okay, this number one seems to be supporting the no. Uh, so this is our notation we created in that, that, in that setting. Um, 
then we had an, uh, a second participant, a second person in the text saying, you probably shouldn't make that blanket statement without any qualifiers of exception. For many women, birth control pills are very important and are necessary to daily life. And this number two, in our opinion, was a direct attack against number one. So that's why this arrow with this minus. Uh, but then it comes up, okay, what about Viagra? Should that be covered by health insurance? That didn't seem to be much connected with the rest of the dialogue. So that's why we just say, okay, it is a statement, uh, uh, but we are no longer, we are not trying to make it connection with neither no or yes. It's just that and we cannot do much about it. And then we have, um, Statements that are getting much more articulated, like women have the right to choose what to do with their bodies. This seems to us to be definitely an enthymeme. That's why this uh, dotted line. But uh, then the question is, okay, it seems to be a plus for the yes answer to this question. Potentially an answer attacking once again this no, because that's not something you need. But we weren't entirely sure. And then finally, we have a statement like, it is true that women have the right to choose what they wish to do with their bodies, but they have absolutely no power to force insurance companies to pay for them. That should be left to the insurance company and not to the women. Now, this, in one sense, seems to suggest, yes, I agree with number four and supporting it. But at the same time, I'm undermining uh, the link between the number four and the support for the yes. Uh, and perhaps supporting the no. So it's getting more complicated to understand what is the actual implications you can have the, uh, between the different statements that we were analyzing. But the point here is you need to make a decision on what you want to annotate from text and how you want to annotate it. Um, and once you choose this annotation, you have to just live with that one. And that is going to create your corpus of analysis you are going to use in your, uh, in, in, your, um, in, in your system. Indeed, given a large resource of natural language text and given an annotation scheme, you can now create an, annota an annotation corpus that it can be also be used as a training set uh, for a machine learning algorithm. So for instance, colleagues in Dundee have created uh, what is called the IFTB, uh, that is a corpus, a corp several corpus, several corpora uh, of uh, annotated uh, argumentations. Uh, for instance, this one is a picture from the website about Mural Maze. Mural Maze is a BBC radio program and uh, colleagues in Dundee have a special relationship with BBC uh, and uh, they are collaborating with, with that one uh, very closely. And uh, in particular, they were analyzing um, uh, um, this radio uh, program, Moral Maze, and they produced several uh, argumentation maps, uh, annotations annotated from, from these radio, uh, uh, radio debates. Okay, you can have your annotated corpus. You, at this point, the question is, you want to assess how good this corpus is. And uh, in argumentation mining, often people are, are referring to the kappa uh, uh, score. Um, so the co uh, Cohen's kappa is essentially the agreement between two annotators or more uh, classifying N items uh, into mutually, uh, C mutually exclusive categories. The, um, the formula is in, 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 in the picture, but in a sense is taking a, 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 the ratio between the relative observed agreement among annotators, the probability of chance of agreement, and uh, this number that comes out uh, can be interpreted uh, generally according the, to this guideline. So if you have something above 81, 0.81, then it's very good uh, agreement. Uh, if you have between 61, 0.61 and 0.80, it's substantial. If it is below 60, it's moderate or no agreement whatsoever. 
So the idea is you have humans uh, annotating uh, text uh, here, and you should have at least more than one human annotating this piece of text, and then you should actually check whether different humans agree on what they see uh, 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 on the text, whether that is an actually an argument and which type of argument, et cetera, et cetera. And that impacts your choice of annotation schemes because the more the engineering here, the more is going to be most likely the disagreement uh, between the different annotators. But once you have all of this, you know how good is your annotated corpus with the kappa, and you have these annotated corpus that can be used as a training um, uh, test for your grammar, your classifiers. And uh, for this one, because it's, a, uh, in essence, natural language processing, um, it is worth reminding that the, 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 the research in this domain is moving really fast. Uh, so what I, if uh, preparing the slide two months ago would have been outdated, so I did not even try. Uh, what I would recommend is to look, this book has been published this year, and it has a summary of the, of the, um, of the approaches in using machine learning up to date for augmentation mining, in particular for segmentation and uh, for classification of, uh, according to different um, uh, annotations corpus. And uh, I've been aware last week that at ACL, two weeks ago, there has been a tutorial from colleagues in Dundee uh, in, uh, on argumentation mining. And I saw inside that there are uh, even more reference to uh, uh, approaches that are up to date to a couple of weeks ago. I saw that at ACL this year has been published other papers on argumentation mining, so I would recommend everybody to have a look at that one. Um, and then there are a couple of other tutorials, uh, particularly uh, linked to argumentation mining, and uh, uh, although they are a little more outdated, they are uh, very good background reading. But in essence, the big problem is in argumentation mining is argumentative discourse varies a lot. You can have a piece of information that is an entire argument in a single word. The word can be yes, no, and that can be just a, 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 a huge anthemim uh, for which that one is the conclusion and there is a lot of presuppositions behind. Or you can have an entire paragraph that is representing just a piece of information that you are using as a premise of another piece of argumentation. So that is a problem that is still open in the community. Um, type of segmentation, are we talking about facts, opinions, and uh, how you distinguish between them, if any? And then, uh, this notion of uh, relation between the different type of uh, pieces of information there, the direction, uh, the type, whether it's a support, an attack, if it is a support, or which type of argumentation schemes is behind. Uh, the direct directions is one directional, bidirectional, what is the meaning of this uh, direction, is a premise to conclusion, is a if and only if. All of these is definitely open questions for two reasons. The first one is uh, um, understanding uh, uh, this type of relationship in, in general in natural language text is not solved. And second, in the case of argumentation mining, we still do not have enough argumentation corpora with enough rich uh, um, uh, description of, uh, of this type of, of relations. Because argumentation in particular is not as trivial as I was describing early this morning. This, this, early this morning I was considering a very simple approach to argumentation, but in natural argumentation, natural language text, you can have a variety of uh, possible structures. So you can have a very simple argument premise to conclusion or two premises to conclusion 
or two different arguments converge into the same conclusion, or a long chain of, uh, of premises to conclusion to conclusion to conclusion, or even a single premise linking to multiple conclusions. All of these are absolutely possible and happen often in uh, natural language text. So you can just see here the variety of possible type of connections between different statements in natural language text. But if you are um, lucky enough to have a good uh, annotated corpus to, and you're using the right uh, classifiers, then you can end up in automatic annotated arguments. The, 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 the greatest success stories I, uh, I'm aware of are uh, linked to uh, argumentative discourses uh, in a scholarly type of environment where um, students are asked to produce essays that are argumentative and uh, an argumentation mining system can be used to uh, try to uh, help the marker in ident identifying what are the main, um, the main points in favor or against uh, the, the, the argumentation a student put forward and that potentially helps with a mark. But at this point the question is how to do uh, uh, the analysis of the performance and uh, standard uh, approaches here are actually used in argumentation mining. Uh, so we generally use recall, precision, and F1 score. Um, that is sometimes suboptimal in particular because sometimes the task is not to just classify some links, but the task might be more complicated, like uh, reconstruction of an enthymeme. An enthymeme is uh, an argument with missing premise or missing conclusion because these pieces of information are um, left hidden or left as part of the context or uh, they are subsumed by part of the conversation behind. So it might be that uh, the, the evaluation uh, it would require a little more of caution here and in some, for some tasks of argumentation mining you actually need to rely on humans to evaluate what is the result of the automated uh, annotation. But once you have all of this only if you have all of these, then you can actually do from real argument back to automatically extracted argument. Um, so the selling point here, the, 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 the summarizing point here is that argumentation mining is hard, is far from being solved, but is not just having, uh, uh, we don't, it's not yet solved for a variety of reasons, including the fact that we do not have very good corpora, uh, we do not have a unified approach to um, label uh, most of the text. Uh, different school of thoughts are using different approaches here. Uh, so it's not just a matter of identifying the, the, the best LSTM model for, uh, for classifying uh, the next, uh, 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 for classifying uh, relationship between statements, is much more complicated is definitely uh, relies on substantial number of assumptions and is very fast and dynamic world. And there are competing schools here. There is a school more in the computational models of argumentation that is moving slightly slower, but they are trying to link with the uh, literature behind it on argumentation schemes, on uh, formal models of argumentation, on philosophies like uh, uh, um, um, notions of um, defeasible rules, strict rules, which type of argumentation is behind, and then in particular linguistics and natural language processing that is moving much fast, much more in the direction of uh, using uh, automated models for uh, extracting knowledge directly from text. So if the magic box one is uh, early stage for argumentation from formal argumentation, um, there is much more to do here. For the magic box two, so evaluation of arguments, we have a little more of results that uh, we can already see in terms of using machine learning for supporting argumentation. And uh, um, 
most of what I'm going to describe is based on papers that uh, with colleagues we uh, published uh, a couple of years ago and this year as well later on. So, and most of these slides here are uh, courtesy of a colleague of mine who is the co-author, uh, Mauro Vallati. But the idea is, this morning I discussed that uh, there are several um, argumentation semantics, there are several decision problems or enumeration problems there, and uh, we know that some of those problems are very complex at the first or second level of the polynomial hierarchy. Uh, we know actually if, uh, after a, a, a few minutes ago who are the winner of the solvers among the, uh, the, the, the last competition on computational models of argumentation. So the question is, we, if we have a set of argumentation frameworks and we want to analyze them, uh, what we could do is pick up the, a solver that uh, seems to perform recently, uh, like the winner of the last competition, but then the question is, sometimes you need to, the, to have it uh, really fast. Um, a colleague of us this morning was mentioning uh, probabilistic argumentation. Uh, we are not going to talk about that today, but for some of our approaches in probabilistic argumentation, you need to explore the semantics uh, extension of different argumentation frameworks that are generating a subset of an argumentation framework. So you have a almost exponential, well, a large number of running of the same argumentation uh, or the same solver for computing the probabilities and trust me that is becoming really long unless you have a very performant solver. Now the question is yes we can improve manually uh, on, on each of them or we can start learning something in order to make a faster uh, uh, solver here. So the idea is in essence we have a generic solver we apply some sort of knowledge about the problem, about the possible uh, solutions that we can have there for addressing this problem, and the idea is that uh, we get a knowledge boost approach down the line. Now, that is works fine in theory, but in practice is if you have a car like this one that is perfectly uh, working here, um, but uh, what happens if you are running something like this? Today we learned that uh, the winner of the argumentation competition of, uh, of this year uh, does not, works very well, on, for instance, on most of the, uh, of the problems that also the other solvers uh, manage to, to solve, just a little faster. Uh, but uh, it does not help in really hard problems. So. What we can do, in essence, is try to use machine learning for uh, identify combination and selection of solvers, configure the solvers themselves, and eventually reconfigure the input uh, before the solver in order to affect the performance. Now, regarding the combination of uh, solvers, the idea is to create a portfolio of uh, argumentation, abstract argumentation solvers, uh, such that uh, uh, this portfolio can be used to analyze an, a single argumentation framework instance with a specific problem. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, this portfolio should perform better than any single uh, uh, solver uh, used in, in, in that one. We can have two types of uh, portfolios, a static one, such that uh, um, the same portfolio is used for analyzing any argumentation framework, or a dynamic one where the portfolio is configured dynamically uh, depending on the characteristic of a argumentation framework. So in the case of the static portfolio, we have our training set, our candidate solvers, our metric, we have just our machinery to build the portfolio, and that is the result uh, of, of the entire process. And, um, um, a static portfolio is defined by the selected solvers, the order in which the solver will be run. In this case, we were using just uh, uh, single thread uh, portfolios. In, uh, in a later work, we actually extended to parallel portfolios. And uh, the runtime allocated to each of the solver. And uh, we consider two uh, approaches here. One is uh, named shared 
k, where each component solver has been allocated a maximum runtime over k seconds, and uh, the solvers are selected and ordered according to their overall part 10. The part 10 is a metric that's uh, given a solver and a problem, an instance problem, then is taking the time um, that uh, the, the solver needed to solve the problem P if it solves it, otherwise 10 times the timeout if the problem is unsolved. So in this case, differently from the IPC score that I mentioned this morning, this is an absolute measure uh, for any of the solvers. And uh, uh, in, the case, in the second portfolio, static portfolio we consider is the FTSS, that uh, given an empty portfolio, we iteratively add a new solver component or extend the allocated CPU time of a solver depending on what maximizes the increment of the part 10 score of the portfolio. So that is about the static portfolios. What about the dynamic portfolios? The first part is the same, training set, candidate solvers, and metric. But now, instead of having a single portfolio here, the portfolio depends on the testing instance. So we are taking an augmentation framework, we extract features, and on the base of the features of this augmentation framework, we decide which, uh, how to modulate uh, the, 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 the portfolio dynamically, and this is based on uh, performance measurement-based portfolio configurations. So the idea is that uh, for uh, each argumentation framework, we have a, fact, a vector of features that is computed. Uh, the idea is that similar, fish, similar instances should have similar vectors here, and uh, uh, we use empirical performance models to configure uh, the different portfolios. So what about the features that uh, we used for, um, uh, for describing argumentation frameworks? Those are, because augmentation frameworks in the abstract, uh, abstract augmentation frameworks are in essence graphs, then we can just have directly graphs representation and have uh, features based on the graph size, like the number of vertices, number of edges, uh, the degree features, the average, standard deviation, etc. The str uh, strongly connected components features, the number, the average, maximum size, and other graph structures like uh, presence of outer loops, isolated vertex, uh, and then we can have extracting similar uh, features, type of features, even removing information, like uh, uh, moving from a directed graph into an undirected graph, or uh, different type of features from a metric representation of, um, of this graph. And um, in terms of dynamic portfolio, we considered a classification-based uh, um, portfolio where it classifies, given an argumentation framework, into a single category. It corresponds to the single solver predicted to be the best one. So given a, a problem, given an, a, an argumentation framework, then we just select which one we believe is going to be the best uh, solver for that specific uh, problem. Uh, one regression is uh, given a predicted runtime of each solver. Uh, we just choose the one that we predict to be the fastest. And M regression is we select the one that we predict to be the fastest at the beginning, and we give the predicted CPU time plus 10%. Uh, but uh, if that is uh, if 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 the solver does not solve uh, the problem, then we pass to the second one predicted to be the second best. So, what we can start seeing in terms of the results, and this is based on uh, um, solvers and instances that have been submitted to the uh, first in competition in 2015. Uh, this is the best virtual-based uh, portfolio system, and uh, immediately after we have the declassification one seems to be the best one, with the first one that is not dynamic here, uh, the FDSS, uh, at this point, and the first uh, solver uh, that uh, was one of the winners in that competition uh, is immediately after. So in essence, the shared one uh, doesn't, do not seem to be uh, performing very well in, in this specific context. In terms of um, um, which solvers um, have been used by, 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 uh, by our portfolio, it is actually interesting to see that uh, 
servers that uh, did not perform remarkably well during the competition, like this one that is um, a non-reduction based one, has been used substantial amount of time for the classification one, while this one that was actually one of the best one coming out of the competition uh, was substantially used during the M regression uh, case. We also did an analysis of whether we can uh, generalize our, our results. So in this case, we train our, class, uh, our portfolios without sum of graph structures. So each, um, the instant, set of instances were belonging to either uh, random augmentation frameworks built on uh, using a Barabasi Albert type of structures, or a Erdos Rini, or a Watt Strogatz, or a one that is guaranteed to have a lot of uh, uh, stable uh, extensions. And uh, if we are um, removing uh, from the training set each of them, then we can just analyze how good is the, the resulting one. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, classify seems to be uh, regardless quite, um, quite uh, good. Uh, apart from the case of stable M, suggesting that uh, there are some features that, that uh, seems to be uh, particular, of particular importance uh, for, uh, for the creation of this uh, portfolio. So to conclude this uh, bit on, on the uh, portfolio-based systems, um, generally they outperform simple solvers. Um, if the training instances are representative of testing AFS, the existing set of features is informative for selecting the most suitable solver generally. Um, the classification-based portfolios are pretty good in terms of generalization. And definitely the static portfolios are uh, less sensitive to different training set as expected because they are static. But now that is about portfolios, but uh, there are cases where we have a single argument, a uh, single solver, like the one that I mentioned earlier this morning, ArxMSAT, and uh, we have a lot of parameters. If you remember the pseudo code I showed you this morning, there were several parameters inside that pseudo code. Uh, there are even more in, in the case of, the, of ArxMSAT in the basis of uh, which SAT solver to use, what are the uh, uh, the parameters of the test solver. So the idea is that uh, we want to automatically configure um, this, uh, this solver for, on the basis of the uh, in problem and instances uh, that we are facing. And uh, for uh, what we did in, in the paper I mentioned, we used SMAC that has been uh, proposed by Frank Carter and colleagues uh, a few years ago. Uh, that is um, essentially performing a local search in the space of configuration parameters in order to identify a good, good enough solution for a specific uh, problem of instance. So as I was mentioning uh, this morning, I was talking about different configurations of complete labelings, and uh, those are one of the parameter in this uh, that we considered. Uh, that is just a representation for, for, the, for the action implementation. But then in this case, we are using glucose as a SAT solver. So we actually exported all the parameters of glucose and we uh, uh, configured our overall uh, framework um, uh, on the basis of all the possible uh, parameters here. Not only, about the, the argument, not only about the solver itself, but also the input that we are giving to the solver can be configured. So although the, the input file is something along those lines, like uh, uh, this is in the Aspartex format, where we have this argument, doing this argumentation framework, A1 and A3 mutually attacking, A3 attacking A2 that is self-defeating, then this will be transformed into this piece of text file. But uh, the way we are writing down this piece of text file as an impact on the performance itself. So writing down the, the, the changing the order of arguments or changing the order on how the attacks are listed has an effect on some of the data structures when they are created in the, in, uh, in the software. 
So we actually parameter we actually parameterized the way we could create the instance as input uh, to the uh, uh, to the framework, and those were additional parameters we gave to Smack in order to perform the search in the space of uh, parameters in order to optimize for different uh, instances. So the result is that uh, for uh, Barabasi Albert type of structures, the default has this line of, of results, but uh, the configured is fastest in 60% of the times, uh, with a substantial improvement in terms of IPC score. Uh, in the case of Erdos Rini, is 18% is the fastest. In the case of Watts Strogatz, the improvement is not uh, so clear, is actually not always the case. Um, and uh, in general, when we are merging all the piece of information, all, all the type of structures together, the actual improvement is, uh, is quite substantial. We also did uh, cross-validation by training on some set and testing on others. And uh, what we saw is that uh, this is particular uh, interesting here, so that uh, the uh, training on Barabasi, Albert, but then testing on Erdos, Rene, uh, seems to be having a very bad performance, uh, and that is uh, suggesting that uh, uh, the features and uh, the configuration we have on this one are definitely not informative for some of the other graph structures. Regarding the most important single parameters, this one is our uh, uh, configurations of complete labelings. This is the actual configuration that uh, we saw that uh, in, in most of the cases or oh, merging all the results together is the most performant and that is what I, I mentioned earlier today that is uh, C in left, C out left, C undecided, uh, sorry, C in right, C out right, uh, C undecided right. But interestingly enough for Barabasi Albert uh, you should use a different type of complete labeling encoding. And here we see that for Erdos Vreni, the way you are configuring uh, your, um, your argumentation framework, so how you reorder uh, the, the, um, uh, the, um, the name of the arguments matters. And in this case, it says that uh, if you are putting all the arguments that are unattacked as first, you have a substantial improvement in the performance uh, overall. Finally, um, in this case, it's the part 10, uh, sorry, the, um, the, uh, um, the, uh, yeah, the part 10, and uh, we can see that uh, there is a combined effect of merging something that comes from the configuration of the instances, so this one is uh, one of the parameters that you can use for configuring uh, how to write down the input instance. And this one comes from glucose. And uh, our best result is obtained only combining these two together. So that is one of the main takeover that has never been seen in, in argumentation theory before. So demonstrated a joint AF's configuration as a uh, joint AF solver configuration has a statistically significant impact on the performance, at least in ARC and SAT. Um, we demonstrate synergies between AF configuration and SAT solver behavior. And the idea is that what's next in terms of using machine learning for improving the performance uh, of argumentation solvers, in particular after the results we saw today of the new competition. But it's not just making a solver faster or solving a uh, uh, problem faster is also get, gaining insight in the actual solutions even before computing the solution itself. So this is, has been published a few months ago and um, uh, in this paper we essentially look at uh, the question can we predict the number of extensions? Uh, if you remember what I was mentioning earlier today about the CA Spaces system that was designed for supporting intelligence analysts in their sense-making activities. But now the question is, if they need to explore 10 or 15 possible extensions 
for that specific situation? Is that feasible? Can they keep in mind that one? Or would that not be useful for them to know, look, the way you are going in, in, in your analysis is going to have a substantial impact on the number of possible extensions that you will have to analyze down the line. So what we did is um, having a multi-level uh, uh, approach here where the first level we take the preferred extensions, preferred semantics, and we try to compute whether there is an empty one or whether there is at least uh, one or exactly one or more than one. So this is the classification at uh, the first level, whether the, uh, the preferred extensions is empty, uh, whether there is one that is not empty, or whether there are more than one. And if there are more than one, whether uh, whatever regression one on the number, uh, and also given a specific pivot number, uh, like in this case we used uh, seven, um, just coming from the, the uh, uh, psychology uh, 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 paper suggesting that uh, our short-term memory can remember up to seven things, but that is just an arbitrary parameter. Classifying whether there are less than seven uh, preferred extensions or more than seven, and then having the regression on the total number. So the features we consider for, uh, from argumentation frameworks are exactly the same uh, I mentioned before. So direct graphs and direct graphs uh, merging the two of them together, uh, metrics or merging all of them together. And uh, in this case, using the overall ICCMA 2015 uh, benchmarks, we can have pretty good results in terms of accuracy if you are considering, for instance, the all uh, at the level one with very good precision to detect whether uh, there is a non-empty uh, solution to the preferred extension uh, semantics, which is, we already know, is MP complete itself. Um, and uh, when it comes down to the second level, uh, we have a decent uh, precision, at least uh, uh, around the pivot number that we considered. Um, we also considered um, argumentation frameworks with structures. At that time, when we started doing this analysis, we did not have enough data coming from uh, the cspaces.org um, uh, project. So we created our set of instances that are based from uh, a logical representation of uh, planning instances and uh, a, a representation in Dung's argumentation framework uh, of rules like uh, uh, this material implication not A, uh, comma not B implies C can be transformed into this uh, Dung's argumentation framework. And that has been described in the paper, uh, paper that uh, we published in 2015. And if you are using this type of uh, data structures, then uh, the accuracy at the level one bumps to 100, but that is because we already know that there is at least one uh, 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 preferred extensions here. But uh, and then the level of the accuracy level two is pretty good. Uh, the precision uh, below seven is pretty low because there are very few instances that have less than seven um, 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 uh, preferred extensions. Um, but uh, that's why uh, the precision after is also uh, particularly uh, good. So as, you, as always, you choose uh, your, uh, your benchmark, you can have your results out of your uh, machine learning, which is one of the take, uh, take home messages here. However, um, the first results were we, uh, the, 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 the model uh, can detect whether our uh, uh, AF as a non-empty preferred extension is already quite interesting as a, a quite complex problem in abstract argumentation framework. Um, we can distinguish when there is one or more preferred extension very easily, which is going to be already pretty useful in, in, some, uh, in some settings. And uh, if more than one preferred extension is predicted, uh, we can predict decently the, the log number. Um, and uh, we can definitely discriminate a, around a pivot uh, pivotal number of extensions with pretty good accuracy using benchmarks that are coming from ICCMA 2015. So to summarize this bit about uh, what uh, machine learning can do for argumentation, 
There is the magic box one that is how we can create um, arguments, and that is essentially an application of natural language processing plus, uh, plus uh, uh, elements of formal argumentation for uh, creating of arguments. And then there is the magic box too, that is how we can evaluate arguments in terms of semantics extensions, computation of semantics extensions at the level of abstract argumentation, and even more be down the line. On this magic box too, we have some more stable results. Magic box one is a wild west uh, of, of, of approaches and uh, there are not yet final solutions there. So that is very much open questions. Another question is what argumentation can do for machine learning? And um, This part comes <clears throat> partially from a paper that uh, we published um, last year with colleagues in, in Huddersfield. And uh, um, we are going to take a very naive approach to what is um, a, a, a machine learner system. So in general, you start from some data here. From the data, you derive a model. From the model, you are doing some inferencing. Now, humans are inputting, uh, having an input on the level of the data and definitely of the model. You need to choose what are the data you're using for your training, and you need to use, choose what is the model you want to use for your training. At the very end, once you're doing your inferencing, then the human must be aware that there has been an algorithmic presence uh, that uh, uh, was behind the uh, decision happening uh, through this uh, automated system. So regarding the first question, are we using quality data? Uh, that comes back again to um, a problem of identifying whether we have evidence enough that this data is good uh, for the sake of what we want to do. And uh, um, if you are looking at uh, a logical approach for arguing about evidence that has been uh, proposed uh, a few years ago, is you can see inside that uh, it must be following argumentation proce process constructing reason for or against competing claims. Evidential arguments should be increased to reduce confidence in claims. Uh, set the repariables, the most independent and sound arguments for a given claim, the greater our confidence in such a claim. So in other sense, you can construct arguments in favor or against whether to use a specific data set for the specific purpose that you have at hand. And you will end up, if you're following all of 10 of these um, uh, suggestions, exactly in the same direction we were earlier this morning, where we were considering formal argumentation as an approach for epistemology. So please go back to the first part of this tutorial. But then, we come to the level of the model. So let's suppose that we choose the best data and we have all the argument in favor of why this is the best data with all the best characteristics that we want to exploit in our machine learner. We choose our model, this, the choice of the model, uh, the same applies as before. But then the question is, okay, we have this model, what, what should we do with it? So the question is how we can talk to the model and what can be meaningful conversation we can have with this model. In other terms, if this is the, our model, our magic black box doing stuff for us, we might have questions for the magic box and we would expect some piece of information coming out uh, from this magic box. Earlier at uh, the XAI workshop, a uh, colleague mentioned this paper, uh, suggesting uh, that uh, uh, whenever you have a machine learning system, you can still think about interpretability of explainability, but in reality, this notion of explainability, interpretability, is dependent on the audience. Sorry, if you want. Um, so given a machine learning system, uh, you might have the creator of the, of the machine learning system that are uh, 
affected here, which means that uh, you might want to have a sort of explanation that is borderline with debugging. That. You want to see whether your system is actually working. Uh, you might have examiners, so you want to have independent people checking that the machine learning system is doing what it's supposed to do. You might have data coming from some subjects, so you want to be ensure that uh, these people can have an access to these uh, uh, machine learning system to ensure that their data has been used properly. And then you have the operators who are using the machine learning system for some purpose, and each of these actors will need different and tailored type of explanation and uh, conversation with the machine learning system. And each of them might have different type of dialogues. Now, argumentation theory can help here because although this morning I was taking a very monological type of approach to formal argumentation, where we were just thinking about what were the best arguments, argumentation cr was created or is naturally happening in human settings in a sort of dialogue. And uh, since at least 1995, even earlier in any case, but in 1995, uh, Douglas Walton and Harry Crabb um, proposed a taxonomy of uh, 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 dialogues types uh, that can be of relevance here. They started by saying, well, some dialogues are information seeking, where one participant is trying to obtain information from another. You might have now that uh, an expert consultation is a type of information seeking type of dialogue. Uh, you can have a, a didactic type of dialogue, or an interview, or an interrogation one as well. You can have an inquiry type of dialogue where you are trying to find a proof of something. You can have a persuasion dialogue where one participant tried to convince another about a proposition. By the way, all of those lies are courtesy of Simon Parsons. Um, or you can have a negotiation dialogue where you want to divide a scarce resource between different participants. You might want to deliberate a course of action. Or finally, you can actually have an heuristic where there is no uh, ultimate goal apart from the destruction of the opponent view. And uh, Walton and Crabb discussed this type of, uh, 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 of dialogues on the basis of what is their main goal and what is their initial, the initial situation between the different participants. So if you want to achieve a stable agreement or a resolution and you start from a conflict, then what you are trying to do is essentially persuade one party uh, of, of the benefit of one solution. For instance, this is behind uh, work that colleagues in UCL are doing uh, in order to um, uh, support behavioral change for benefit of society, uh, like persuading people to do more activity or reducing uh, uh, their intake of calories or smoking uh, by using, by the means of argumentation. But if your initial situation is an open problem and you want a stable agreement and resolution, then you are entering the realm of inquiry. And then finally, if you have an actually set spread of information and you want a stable agreement or a resolution, you are going into an information seeking. If you want a practical settlement or a decision, then you want either a negotiation or a deliberation. While if you just want to, somebody to say, sure, fine, you win, I just don't care, then you essentially are going into the heuristic type of dialogue. Now, my take here it will be that uh, for the sake of argumentation supporting machine learning, you, we are looking at in one of these three. Um, and which one depends on which one is the actor involved in this discussion. So one operator might need to be persuaded of using some of the outcome coming out of the uh, machine learner. Uh, information seeking might be very much used for, uh, instead for, for a debugging type of uh, attitude. Now, Walter and Crabb were very influ influential from 1995. They actually did much more than just this taxonomy. I invite everybody to read the book. It's a lovely book. Um, 
but uh, uh, there were also other type of dialogues that uh, were not involved there, like a non-cooperative dialogue. I hope that that is never going to happen in the case of uh, machine learning, but that is something that uh, you need to be aware. There are dialogues that might never be ending uh, because uh, that might be the purpose of one of the party. So there are presuppositions behind several of these dialogues, structures that is, at least there is good faith in each of the member involving in this dialogue. But otherwise, you need to be ready to be able to detect whether uh, there is this type of strategy of non-cooperation and then putting in place uh, appropriate measures. So very nice from a philosophical perspective, how can that be transformed into computer science? The way argumentation, formal argumentation uh, does it is in the form of protocols. Uh, that is a way to restrict the type of interaction you can have between different agents for supporting a specific type of dialogue. This type of protocol sets the context, place constraints, and um, uh, it is assuming that uh, both parties or all the parties agree in advance on what is the protocol that is going to be used, otherwise the result is just going to be confusion. Protocols are happening in human uh, society, even if you are not uh, thinking about that one. So in, uh, in 1800, it was customary that uh, when entering a railway compartment, make sure to shake hands with all the passengers, that is a protocol. That is the beginning of a conversation or the beginning of just a social interaction. We have protocols in TCPIP when we are starting our conversation between two machines. So protocols are happening everywhere. So what is a protocol in formal argumentation? Is uh, a way to define a dialogue that is on the base of what utterances, what locutions are allowed and at which time. Um, so a possible locution is, I'm asserting that P is the case. And a dialogue is just a sequence of utterances. So for instance, I can just say assert P, challenge P, assert Q, Q implies P, and then accept Q, and then something else. Therefore, a protocol is given a, a, a dialogue, returning a set of utterances, and um, 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 and an example, examples of uh, formal dialogues you can find in literature from at least the 2000s, and I'm going to refer to just one of them uh, coming from uh, a paper pr presented at AMAS in 2003, uh, where you can uh, start having two agents, but it can be generalized to many agents. Um, and uh, A can start by asking a question P. Uh, B can reply with either asserting P or asserting not P or asserting this U uh, if it cannot. We are coming to this U after. Um, at this point, A can accept B's response if it can or otherwise it challenges. And uh, if it is challenges, then uh, it needs to assert S that S is the support of an argument for uh, the last proposition challenged by A, and then you just repeat uh, to the point three. This U in particular indicates that uh, a party member cannot give an answer. Uh, it cannot be challenged, and as soon as somebody say, I just don't know, I can, don't ask me anymore, the, the dialogue terminates. Um, there is a presumption here, which is that uh, that is about the non-cooperative type of game. So if uh, A can accept, it must accept. That is one of the presumptions behind. Um, and A is, is able to challenge something only if it is unable to accept it. So if only if there is a reason not to accept it. Um, there is also uh, general assumptions that uh, you cannot repeat the same locution twice. That is often a, a, a case in, 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 uh, in formal argumentation for dialogues. So in essence, 
given a specific question, you can create a, a finite state automaton that represents all the possible states in which you are. And as you can see, there are not so many, at least not for this specific protocol, which means that uh, yes is a restrictive protocol. Uh, it doesn't allow a lot of flexibility, but that is exactly what uh, we intended to do in, 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 in formal argumentation. We want to have co uh, constraint uh, protocols for guiding the interaction. Now, what we did uh, in a more recent paper was trying to apply similar type of ideas in the case of analyzing uh, Bayesian networks that were learned automatically in order to support some sort of inquiry from a, a, a possible decision makers using this type of system. So what we did is uh, given a Bayesian network that is learned, learned just using a C3 argument that, that is just boring, uh, the weights are just coming from uh, observed data that is actually boring as well. But then the question is, okay, that is what each of us would recognize a Bayesian network. Uh, you can imagine here to have the condition of probability stable here. That's not important. But the question is how a, a final user could use or make an informed decision out of this uh, uh, Bayesian network. Then we can envisage, envisage this, um, uh, this conversational interface where that is using control natural language, in particular, a uh, language that has been developed by IBM. The first author of this paper is a colleague from IBM, Hursley Park. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the system can just say, how can I help you? And then the user can ask questions or say something uh, to, the, to, the, to the system. Now, we did uh, uh, user ana uh, 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 um, analysis with a, a few uh, colleagues, uh, uh, sort of focus group, asking what would be the what would be the type of commands that they would use more often in this type of inter uh, of conversational interface, and the the three that uh, uh, were would have been used by all the members very often, according to what they said, where one of them is explain one of these in detail in essence, explaining one of these variables in, this, in details. And in this case is uh, Henkel here. So this is about a data set from the German stock market. Uh, each variable is binary. And it says that uh, uh, the, um, <clears throat> uh, whether the stock market value of Daimler is increasing or decreasing in the next day or not. That is just the binary uh, the variable here. And uh, here we have that, for instance, the BM BMW stock market value is affected by Daimler. Uh, Henkel is affected by Bayer. Okay? So uh, the answer that uh, the system can say is that uh, Henkel stock price depends on Bayer. And by, when Bayer stock price changes, there is a high confidence that uh, Henkel stock price will likely to change. Now, instead of using just Bayesian networks with probabilities, we used an extension of that one with uncertain probabilities using subjective logic opinions. That is just details. Happy to talk about that one. That is irrelevant for this, for the, for this uh, tutorial. But in essence, instead of just having a probability, you have uh, three numbers where the first one represents the degree of belief in a specific proposition. The second one, the degree of disbelief. And the third one is the degree of uncertainty. Uh, on this proposition. These three numbers sum up to one, which means that if you don't have uncertainty, then this two must be one, uh, one minus the other, um, which means that uh, in the case of dogmatic probabilities, you just ended up having standard probabilities here. But if you have uncertainty, you can say how much confidence you have in that one. This is just another way to represent either beta distributions or Dirichlet distributions. Now, the first one that the user was saying would I use is explain Ankel in detail, fine. So they want to have a grasp of what is the fact of this, uh, of the importance of this variable. But then more important and more interesting was what happened if, what if, the what if type of questions were particularly of interest for uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, users. So they want to say what happened in detail if Porsche and Continental stock price changes. So the question is, what happens if I'm injecting evidence that uh, uh, Porsche 
uh, PAH3 PAH is becoming one, and continental is one as well. What is the effect? And then the question is, okay, you want to just explain what is going to change uh, by the means of this injection of evidence in this variation network. And the last one is, people want to tell us things that they know is true, although the machine learning system did not find it from the data. So for instance, they want to tell us, well, I know that uh, Bayer and Daimler are connected because perhaps they are uh, often exchanged together on secondary markets or for uh, uh, retirement pension schemes. So we know that they are very closely linked together and we know that uh, uh, Bayer depends on Daimler. So in essence, they want us to, to add some causal links out of their knowledge and then yes, after that one we can just say, fine, you tell us what we did in this work. He said, you tell us what is the additional causal link, then the actual weight behind we are going to recompute from data. Uh, but uh, another way is to ask the user also to uh, provide this type of, uh, of weight, yes. So <clears throat> because we are learning the probabilities uh, from data, what the fact that uh, the, the algorithm did not pick up on this correlation is already indicative that probably there is not enough evidence there. So this, this weight, because we are using uh, uh, distributions here, what, what it would happen most likely is to say that uh, this last number is going to be very high. So you say, you are telling me that there is a causal link, but we are very uncertain. Um, but ultimately, the dialogue assumes good faith from both parties. That is one of the assumptions. I agree that uh, uh, you can, we can do something more sophisticated, in particular in, in adversarial situations. Uh, what we are doing is considering the data and giving priority to the data, uh, in particular if the data has very high level of accuracy behind. Uh, but uh, ultimately the idea is that uh, there are situations for which there is not enough data, and uh, in, in the project I'm involved we are interested in sparse data, so we need to rely on experts which means that we are assuming that experts are telling us the truth. However, if we have contradictory points from different experts, then what I mentioned earlier in the first part of this tutorial becomes relevant to assess the, uh, uh, the relative weight of different witnesses or different experts and assess which one might be more trustworthy. So I, am, I can talk about that one more if you want. Um, but yes, in general, for this specific, uh, work, we assume good faith from all the participants for this one. So, I hope that uh, I, I convinced that uh, uh, explaining a model or, or, or there is the need for a communication act between uh, an autonomous agent and humans, and uh, these two parties can engage using a formal protocol behind. Um, and in that specific uh, approach, we use uh, control natural language just to be sure to avoid ambiguity in the conversation, but other approaches are clearly possible. However, if you're in, uh, this last act from the user was not asking a question, was not a what if, was not explain something, was I know something and I'm telling you this is true. Whether it's true or a lie, that is a different question. Which means that uh, there are cases where the user uh, wants to give information to the magic black box, perhaps following questions. Questions from the back, lock, back, back black box can be in, in, in a sort of reinforcement learning type of settings, perhaps uh, you, the, 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 the box try to assess what is the, 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 the value of the state in which they are. But even if there are no questions, user might still want to inject tell information to a machine learner system. Now, logic has been already used uh, as a regularizer uh, in machine learning systems. <clears throat> this is not coming from me or any of my colleagues. This but was pretty influential on, on using semantic loss function uh, with symbolic knowledge, where in essence, given a deep network, the last, the last layers 
are created in a way, the decision layers are created in a way to support specific type of constraints, like uh, uh, we just want to have a specific um, output out of N, uh, whether we want to have a specific ranking, uh, whether we are searching a path in a graph or, or others. And in essence, what they did is to encode knowledge um, in, a, uh, in a differentiable fashion. Um, so in essence, this one is a logical circuit that uh, allows you to say, I just want exactly one out of three options to be true, and that must be the case uh, in, in whatever training you are doing. Uh, and then you can just transform this one into a, a problem type of fashion here using probabilities instead of logical connectives. Now, I'm pretty sure that uh, at least uh, these gentlemen here will be here at each guy because he's going to receive an award on Friday. So you're more than welcome to talk to him about this work. I'm just using this work as an example of how uh, logic can be injected as a regularization function uh, into learning models. But uh, if you're looking from an argumentation perspective, one would just say, well, great, instead of using just classical logic, uh, we can just use argumentation because argumentation should be closer to human experience, right? The answer to this question is yes, but. So in, from 2014, we did a uh, um, series of experiments with uh, users trying to assess whether the result of semantics uh, semantics extensions computed from uh, specific argumentation frameworks were consistent with the uh, expected outcome of uh, participants or the equivalent of participants through uh, Mechanical Turk. And um, the experiment that we envisaged uh, was to uh, presenting each particip participant uh, with a piece of text followed by questions. Each participant is shown only one piece of text uh, and uh, we derived argumentation frameworks uh, based on four different domains, whether focus, political debate, used car sale, and romantic relationship. And uh, for each domain, there were two cases, uh, a base case that always considered two arguments, A1 and A2, with two contradicting conclusions, and a preference in favor of A2, and then the extended case reinstate A1. So in essence, Think about uh, uh, the, 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 the case of, of the weather forecast was something like uh, uh, CNN is saying that tomorrow will rain. BBC says that tomorrow will be cloudy but not rain. And we know that always BBC is more reliable than CNN. So one argument in favor of raining, one argument in favor of cloudy but not raining, and a preference in favor of one over the other. And then the extended case is, well, yes, BBC usually was uh, more reliable, but now they cut all the resources for weather forecast, so that is no longer the case. So at that point, this, the reason for this preference comes, uh, is no longer the case, so the question is whether what happened on the conclusion whether tomorrow will rain or not. In the case of political debate, it was something like, uh, if you vote for independence, that was not about Brexit, that was about Scottish referendum. Um, uh, this region will be uh, poor down the line, and that was coming from a, a, an economist, but a politician was saying that, uh, uh, don't worry, everything is going to be fine, we are going to strike a relation with the rest of the world, and we are going to be just fine. Um, and then the preference is why you should pref prefer an economist over uh, a politician. In any case, uh, given the, uh, all of these uh, argumentation frameworks and all the piece of text, um, participants were asked to determine whether they agree with the argument A1, the argument A2, or neither. So the hypothesis was that in the base case, the majority of participants would agree with A2, that was the one that is uh, receiving the pre preference relation. And in the extended cases, the majority of participants would agree that they cannot conclude anything from text. So that, those hypotheses got supported. Um, so in the case, the white boxes are for the base case, and we can see that uh, PB is about A2, so it's, it's the most supported here. Um, and in the case of the extended case, so the, this one, uh, the, the dashed one is, is the most one. 
However, I would encourage you to read the paper because there are several nuances there. So it's not the case in all the settings. If there is an emotional involvement of participants that is coming down, uh, in particular for, for, the, uh, <clears throat> for the romantic relationship, suggesting on whether to start a relationship or not, uh, it was uh, removing the preference created a reverse of the preference, so people preferred the opposite one than the other one. In the case of the weather forecast, because of the domain itself, a lot of people were, were very undecided, even in the base case, because they were saying, is weather forecast? The fact that BBC is more preferred than CNN is not meaning any, anything, is, is Britain and is always raining, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so there are a lot of nuances behind. But more important, uh, although um, um, people seem to suggest to have a skeptical attitude uh, in terms of uh, semantics extensions, so they don't like to have multiple extensions, they just want to have a single coherent view of the reality, and that is the reason why in the extended cases the majority of people went for un complete undecided. Although there were two semantics extensions, one saying either tomorrow we rain or tomorrow we not rain, both of them are logically uh, reasonable. Most of the people would just say, I just don't know. So essentially they took the intersection, the intersection was empty. That is the skeptical attitude uh, towards semantics extensions in abstract argumentation, in formal argumentation. So yes, this seems that people like a single coherent view of the reality and coming to the question that uh, I was receiving earlier today, that is not the entire story. So colleagues, I'm not involved in this, in this work, but colleagues from UCL did a much more extensive type of analysis uh, of, of, student, stu of user studies uh, a couple, last year, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> and uh, they were considering a much more articulated type of settings uh, where um, people were asked to comment on their agreement of different utterances in a dialogue, um, where you have uh, statements like hospital staff members do not need to receive flu shot, but then hospital staff members are exposed to the flu virus a lot, therefore it would be good for them to receive flu shot in order to stay healthy, etc., etc. So they already had in mind what was the argumentation structure behind, which uh, statements were supporting or attacking which other statements. But then they were asking regardless uh, uh, participants whether they agree or disagree with a given statement and they were showing different parts of the dialogue. So uh, part, some participants were just so uh, the first line, others just the first two, others the first three, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, participants were also asked to state how they see the relationship between the different statements, whether it was a support, an attack, or whatever else. And the result is that uh, people like to have a probabilistic view of the reality, or at least some of the observations that uh, the colleagues made was that uh, um, they were coherent with a co constellation approach to probabilistic argumentation. I'm happy to talk about that one down the line if you wish so. Um, and also that uh, people like to have both an attack and a support relation between utterances. If you're using standard Dung's argumentation frameworks, you just have to express attacks, which people like to think not just in terms of attacks, but also in terms of support uh, between different uh, statements. So the point here is, uh, it's kind of true that argumentation semantics are intuitive for humans, kind of. Uh, there are caveats in the sense that you need to choose the right one, and the right one might not necessarily be one of the standard one from Dung's argumentation framework. Something more with the probabilistic flavor might be necessary. There are plenty of caveats here and there, so if you want to use something along those lines in order to use as a regularizer down uh, on top of your uh, machine learners, uh, claiming that that is coming from user, you need to be a little more constrained in the assumption you are making. 
And definitely, uh, I would recommend, um, I was yesterday at the XAI invited talk of Ruth uh, Byrne um, talking about counterfactuals, and I think that is extremely relevant if you are willing to work in terms of <coughs> argumentation and uh, on top of machine learning. So I would definitely recommend everybody to attend her talk uh, at the survey session in at Ichikai. So we are almost done. We look at uh, the data. Uh, it's just a matter of identifying whether that is the right type of data. Model is a long conversation. And now we are at the level of inferencing. So you have your machine learner, and uh, you want to do something with it. Now, if that is part of uh, something that can affect the reality, then you might, uh, uh, you might want to acknowledge that there is an algorithmic presence there affecting your decision or uh, your, your worldview. And it's interesting to see how legal domain already address some of, those, uh, some of those issues. So for instance, in some part of the world, if a, dog, uh, a, a drug dog sniffs something, that is already good enough for stopping somebody and uh, asking this person to open the luggage, et cetera, et cetera, or even detain them. But we don't know what is the reason behind the dog barking or something. So there are indeed cases where uh, a dog is mistaken and is just another black box to consider. In the case of uh, RV Zoo versus, United States versus RV Zoo, it will, you can actually read inside that uh, human experts are often allowed to draw on their own experience and specialized training to make inferences from the deduction about the cumulative information available to them that might well allow, elude an untrained person, which means that judges allow, admit uh, that trained people, trained policemen can just make inferences and sometimes being unable to explain those inferences in a trial. And that is already used as, as, as proofs in different, uh, in, this, in different settings. So what happened in the case of using an argumentation, uh, sorry, a machine learning system in the real world? Well, what we argue in the uh, paper uh, I mentioned earlier <coughs> about unveiling the, uh, the, the, the machine learners is that uh, we can just treat the, the results of this machine learning as another argument. So what we created is an argumentation schemes from what we call autonomous inferencing, saying that uh, we have an autonomous system trained uh, on a specific domain that contains a specific proposition. So uh, the, the training setting and the task that uh, is, is dealing with uh, is matching. This autonomous system says that something is true or false, therefore we should believe it. Now you can extend it this one with accuracy, uh, 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 probabilities, etc. etc. That is uh, part of the, the work that I was mentioning earlier today about uh, assessing a certain uh, source of information. And then the question is whether uh, critical questions are substantially asked uh, in order to accept this argument uh, in favor of this conclusion from this autonomous system, such as, for instance, uh, whether these, uh, there are interests behind the maker of this autonomous system. If uh, this maker is particularly interested in suggesting a specific answer to a specific task, is, does this affect uh, the, the overall acceptance of this argument? Are assertions of this autonomous system internally consistent? There were, other, were there other arguments that uh, the same autonomous system made that might be conflicting with, uh, with, with this one in particular. Um, is the provenance of the judgment of, uh, of this autonomous system about P sound? So we are advocating the use of provenance of information and of a training set and of the inferencing procedure as well. So all of this is a possible way to make sure that uh, humans be aware of an algorithmic presence at the level of inferencing out of an autonomous system. 
So to conclude this tutorial, what we talked about is formal argumentation theory, in particular why it is important, and I took a personal stance in terms of using argumentation for scientific inquiry and epistemology. Um, we consider the case of structural argumentation, in particular for the case of uh, Aspect Plus. There are other systems. I'm happy to talk about that if you want. And then we went into the world of abstract argumentation for assessing whether arguments can be uh, collectively accepted or not. And uh, how to do that one requires algorithm and implementation that are not trivial. We then talk about machine learning for argumentation, and in particular the two magic boxes uh, about uh, uh, creation of algorithm, creation of arguments, uh, in particular from natural language text, so the realm of argumentation mining, and machine learning for supporting the evaluation of argumentation frameworks, that it was magic box two. And finally, we talk about argumentation for machine learning and trying to answer questions about how we can support the choice of quality of data. That comes back to, once again, the beginning of, of what we discussed earlier this morning. Um, explanations and tellability uh, in terms of a dialogue that can happen between a human and uh, an autonomous system, and whether argumentation can be supportive uh, for um, making transparent the presence of algorithms in decisions uh, down the line. Thank you for your attention. I welcome questions now or during the lunch or during the conference. I will be here until Friday. Thank you very much.